Oh, Holy that was... fuck, that was nice. Well, that, that was uh, one part of the trip that my dad said he was going to uh, miss a lot was, um, yeah, the nice hand-pulled ales and stuff like that and cheap, cheap beers. Like, yeah, stuff's expensive down here. And so, you, you yeah. especially in Glasgow and Dumbarton, oh, you're looking at a, yeah, that's where I was for a week. Uh, um, yeah. But you're, you're looking at a full proper English pint, and it was like five dollars New Zealand. Usually, a, a New Zealand pint over here is about twelve to fifteen dollars. So, oh God, gee yeah. whiz, that is uh, a big difference. Yeah, so yeah, better quality, and yeah, so it's definitely. Well, I used to run a I used to run a snowboard chalet in France. That was actually where I met my wife, and um, we used to have um, wine from the supermarket that was like one euro or one euro 50. And we had unlimited wine with the meals. And of course people got so tanked, they couldn't even notice anyway. But one week we had a guy who was actually a wine importer in the UK. And we said, look, can we just do like a blind test? We just want to know, you know, if these are okay or we're losing stomach lining. So we've got a bunch of them and he tried them. We didn't tell him how much they were. And he's like, these are pretty good. They're, you know, perfectly drinkable. Yeah. And <laughs> we told him how much they were. <laughs> <laughs> Probably reevaluated all his values. <laughs> he filled his car up. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, dear. Nah. Alcohol is always overpriced for what it is and how much you can yeah. make it for. I mean, I've got a co worker who does uh, his own homebrew and he's got something that looks like a steampunk sci-fi set up at his house and it doesn't even brew into bottles anymore. He just goes straight to the kegs. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Yeah. Yeah. He's got, <laughs> he brews them into kegs and he's, he says he can get through one in about 10 days. Jeez. Holy fuck. Let me um, turn this other light off. <laughs> hey, the, uh, the more you drink, the less you care, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Oh dear oh dear. All right. We all ready? We all set? Yeah. That's yeah. good because I've been recording for the last five minutes. <laughs> so welcome <laughs> to the Micro Machines Podcast. Yes, it has been uh, quite a while, over a month now, but that's because I decided to go on a nice long holiday and I do the editing, so haha. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So, uh, for the regular host, it is just me and Garrison this week, because Dennis decided to go somewhere that has no broadband, Jack is currently at work, and Ezra, who knows. <laughs> However, we do have a guest with us. We have a very cool special guest. We have the one and only Martin Drayton, also known as MD Scale Models, the Flying Hotel Diorama Specialist with us. Say hi. Good evening. How are you all? Doing very well, mate. Doing very well. Doing pretty good, good yourself. Good. Well, fairly good. I'm just recovering from a bout of COVID that I picked up at the Nationals. I went there with the intention of buying a few kits and stuff. I didn't expect to come away with COVID, but... Ah, well, you know, free stuff's good stuff. (laughs) (laughs) It seemed like the Nationals was a little bit of a hotbed, though, wasn't it? A bit of an outbreak there. It it was last year, but last year I got away with it. But this year, it wasn't until we'd finished our 20-hour return trip that I was feeling a bit rough the next day and then tested and that was that. Yeah, yeah, because uh, old Jeff Hearn, he, he's got it at the moment. And, yeah, there was quite a few people reporting that they came away from that feeling pretty crooks. So, yeah, yeah. hopefully ne- next year it's not as bad. <laughs> I might have to wear a mask next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if I end up going, the, uh, the, the, the prospect of getting COVID whilst having to fly home does not sound fun. No. I mean, oh, right. um, Are you thinking of coming next year? Uh, yep, I might be. Yeah. Well, now I've spent a whole lot of money on my last trip. I need to start saving up because, yeah. I mean, I got twelve months to do it. So maybe I don't know. And Garrison, you'll be there. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the game plan. Um, you know, thankfully the finances were not there this year, and I did not get COVID. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, we should be good to go next year. Cool. And then we're, we're going to try and um, see if we can strong arm um, uh, Dennis and Jack to try and come along. I mean, you know, just, they're probably the closest geologically to than any of us. So yeah, that's true. It's another twenty drive for me. <laughs> Oof. Ne- yeah. Where is it next year? It's in Wisconsin, isn't it? Yeah, Madison. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always wanted to go to the Midwest anyway to have a look. So, I mean, it's, I've just got two excuses now. Are you into cheese? Oh, you better believe it. Oh, well, you're going to Madison then. You're going to enjoy it. Oh, good. Oh, good. I can't wait. It's the cheese capital. <laughs> oh, heavens. That's a, it's a 10 hour, uh, 10 hour drive for me to get to Wisconsin. Yeah. That's, that's not bad. Nah. I mean, it's probably, <laughs> let's see, it's 12 hours for me from Auckland just to get to the West coast. Then from there, it's probably another, how many hours to get up there? Oh God. God, I've only just recovered from my last trip flying and that was horrific. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've flew, well, I flew with Emirates and everyone goes, oh, uh, everyone goes, oh, Emirates, you know, it's bigger. You get more space. As someone who's six foot three and about 110 kilos, that doesn't make much difference. No, no. especially with broad shoulders, because I always sit aisle sight just because I need to go pee a lot. But the problem is my shoulder and arm stick out, and I'm constantly getting, yeah, yeah people are constantly walking into me or the trolley and all of that. It's just, yeah. And then That's if you if you're in the center or in the window you're just crammed in anyway. So uh, I don't, uh, I don't enjoy flying. I can't sleep on a plane or anything like that. So it's just, um, especially the last trip, it was an eight hour straight into a 15 hour flight. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> not, it's not fun. Yes, one plus, if you work for the airlines and you can get an upgrade into first class, you will never want to fly any other way again. Yeah. Once you like a cubicle with a life flat bed and a pillow and a quilt and food on proper cutlery and and yeah spoil forever yeah i mean i'm gonna try and save up as much as i can if i can get myself to business class just to fly just for the next trip i'll be happy yeah but yeah anyway enough about me and garrison because uh we are primarily here for one person that is martin so uh why don't we kick things off shall we shall we do uh garrison i believe you can start with the first question uh yes um so mr martin md scale yeah. models who are you tell us about <laughs> yourself <laughs> for the few people in the hobby that don't know martin by the way <laughs> i mean yeah lots of people don't now i um like most people i started modeling as a kid um you know sort of eight nine ten eleven that kind of age and started building kits with my dad and i'm and usually my dad was actually from the West Indies, from Trinidad, and he had no modeling background, but it was him that got me into it and uh, started me off with a, a frog spitfire. It was appalling. <coughs> and then um, we graduated eventually to uh, like a 124 scale measure smith. So all my building was aircraft. I didn't build anything else. And then just before I stopped at the point, you know, when you discover girls and music and alcohol. And, and <laughs> set, you know, All the good things in life. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I had just started to diversify a bit and I made the odd ship. I made, I think, one tank. But, and then I stopped. But it wasn't until, um, so we're mentioning COVID again, until um, the lockdown happened. I was stuck at home. I had taken unpaid leave from work because my wife was high risk. So I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to put her at risk. So I took time off work. Um, while I was at home, I was stuck with nothing to do, literally nothing to do. And she had remembered that I made model kits as a kid. So she bought me a couple of kits. Um, they were aircraft and, um, I started on those, had a good time with them, thought it was fun. Um, and then it came round to, I think it was our wedding anniversary, and she got me the Tamiya Panther, the basic one, you know, the really old one. Oh, the Panther oh, wow. A. It's the A, isn't it? Yeah. 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 
And I'm still stuck with modeling after that one. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, bear in mind, 40 years had passed. The quality of kits, as far as I was concerned, was amazing. Because my point of comparison was, you know, things like that Frog Spitfire, it had two little pins for a cockpit that you sat the pilot on. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) That That was the cockpit detail, you know. So this Tamiya thing was like sci-fi. I mean, it was futuristic to me. So I made that, really enjoyed it. And then I thought it looks just odd sitting on a piece of paper. So I thought, um, I remembered the word diorama from my past. And I went on to YouTube and I started Googling how to build dioramas. And that's how I got Mm. started. My man. Yeah, my, my, in the rest of my life, I'm a, I have two main jobs. I'm a flight attendant with a big American airline. And um, in the winter, I teach snowboarding, which I've done for 38 seasons, I think. Wow. Yeah. The last Damn. 22 seasons here in Park City in Utah. So Damn, that's you've got to save some talent for the rest of us. <laughs> 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 it, it's kind of ironic. Um, with the old COVID and all that, you know, probably one of the worst things to happen to the uh, world in recent times. I won't say ever, but recent times. Yeah. But yet for the modeling hobby, it was probably one of the best things to happen. Oh, absolutely. Everyone talks about the golden age. And, you know, I can't believe the stuff that's out there and vehicles and aircraft that I knew were obscure that, you know, you can just buy a kit off them now or someone can 3D print it. I mean, things are crazy now. Mm. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Because that, that's about the time when I started, just just before. So, and I've gone through, of course, two two lockdowns here in New Zealand where it was four mm. four weeks and six weeks of just sitting at home because I, I couldn't work. So I spent the whole time yeah. modeling. And when lockdowns yeah. finished, they had to use a crowbar to get me out of the house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you get to the point of six, week six, and you're like, oh, I wouldn't mind going back to work, working outside, all of that. And then the, everyone announces, right, so we're back at work tomorrow. You're sitting there going, really? <laughs> Come on, just, just, nah, just, just, just a bit longer. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. good now. I'm, I regret it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, like I said, I just had a bout of COVID and I think I did two dioramas and, and one tank and a Gundam during that time. It was just <laughs> another lot to do. Mm. Let's go to the next question, shall we? So, of course, how did you get into the hobby? Well, you kind of answered that anyway. Uh-huh. Um, so we might just skip over that one. Okay, so I guess the main question for Martin, of course, um, you are probably most well known for modeling in hotels flying all over the place you know stuff like that so how did how did that all start how did you get into where you are now you're doing all the sort of um you know mobile modeling and stuff like that how how did you get into that so basically once um i went back to work and started flying again i was by that time back modeling and um i was just aware that i was spending a lot of time away from home just sitting in a room in a hotel room just watching Netflix and you know my time is valuable I want to spend time with my family when I'm home but I also want to do some modeling so I suddenly thought you know here was a whole bunch of time that I was basically wasting Um, people you know once we started flying again weren't really going out the way they were to bars and clubs so I was generally sitting in my room and I thought well why don't I take a few bits and pieces to build or paint or so that was how it came about. And um, when I'm modeling at home, I'm just, well, I'm filming now from a, our kitchen table. That's where I model. Um, so I'm used to putting all my stuff away and moving it, you know, so we get our table back. So to put it in a bag instead wasn't that big a deal. And then with my bills, I'm really... <laughs> one part of my life that I am organized, I'm actually organized with my builds in the, for example, I'm making a Makava right now, the Israeli tank. I would write out a list of all the steps that I need to do for this build in order. And then if I have a trip coming up, I think, all right, well, I've got one whole evening in a hotel, or maybe I've got two evenings in two hotels. 
what logically could I get done in that time? And I'll look through my list and I will take just what I need for those steps. Um, one thing that obviously I can't take is like hobby knives. So what I do is I take a pair of clippers, which most people would be horrified at. They're Walmart <laughs> nail clippers. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and take some um, sponge files. And so what I do is snip it as close as I can and file stuff down and, and use that as a replacement. But I mostly do um, things that really work, like construction. When you first start a piece of armor, for example, the construction part, and with most armor, there isn't any internal painting going on. There's a little bit in the, in the turret maybe. But it means I can build quite easily, and, the, and tanks are quite sturdy things. Um, I keep things in uh, sub-assemblies as much as possible. That way um, I do the final build at home, but it means it's easier to transport these separate big chunks, you know, like the chassis and the turret. Or the first one I did, I think, was the um, Battlestar Galactica Viper. And I'd watched a video by John Buis, and um, he had built it at home in – sub-assemblies, which made complete sense. And I was able to do 80% of that kit on the road. And even now, I would say 60% of all my builds, or 60% of each build that I do, is done in a hotel room. One thing that's really um, easy to do in a hotel is figures. You don't need a whole bunch of paints. You don't need a lot of room in your bag. And you know, people have asked me about lighting. Well, most of the time, the hotel lighting is better than I've got at home. So um, usually they'll, they always have a writing desk and I can move things around if I need to and a light that I can sit right under. So it's actually pretty good to do. And if I have anything fragile, I've got like a hard plastic uh, sandwich box and I've got bubble wrap in it and I just stick it in there. I mean, the advantage I do have as a flight attendant is I have control of my luggage. So I know it's not getting thrown anywhere. I'm putting it in overheads or in cupboards. So I know I can look after my stuff. That's how I make it work. I uh, I would say that's uh, that's pretty genius. You know, you, you, you care enough about the family and your time at home and whatnot to, to think outside the box in order to have that modeling time. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. Otherwise, it was just frustrating. I mean, it was, if I do, um, for example, like I might have a Washington trip and have a 30 hour layover. So 30 hours on the ground, um, which gives me an entire day. Okay. I've been to Washington a few times. I've seen the sites and stuff, but you know, I could do 10, 12 hours modeling straight, you know, it's a lot you can get done. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's one I'd say that's one modeling frustration is when you're sitting there, you've got time to do it, but you're not there for it or where you sit there going, I'm doing something useless right now. I could be sitting down modeling, but which, which is why I get very annoyed at work. A lot of the times so it's like, I could be at work, but I could be back home. <laughs> yeah. Work yeah. does tend to get modeling. <laughs> oh boy. Does it. <laughs> now nah, that that's pretty cool. Cause, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of people come up with solutions for modeling and uh, when you're traveling and all that. And doing it in hotel rooms, I mean, there's a, actually a few pe famous people that did it. Um, I believe Rod Stewart would make, um, yeah. he'd book, he'd book yeah. two hotel rooms, one for him and That's right. one for him and it's one for his. Name. Yeah, I found that out. Jesus, I mean, I mean, have, have, you, <laughs> have, you, seen, have you seen that entire thing? No, uh, I've seen, I've seen, I saw like a little news item on it and it was... Yeah. His wife's glad he's not hanging out with groupies and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe his wife's yeah, sitting there looking people. at what he's built, built, going, "You did this instead of groupies." Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, as model as we understand. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like, do you want to go out tonight? Not, no, no. Um, I'm busy. The, <clears throat> the new Tamiya comet just came out. I, I got to build that. The what? <laughs> the thing is. Some of my flight attendant friends, when I'm, they, you know, we're in the shuttle 
on the way to the hotel and they're like so um are you going to go out you're going to do anything i'm like no i'm just going to um do a little painting and they're like they immediately they think of you know artists and a big canvas and they're like really you got paint i said yeah scale model stuff and they're like oh right okay and then they don't usually say anything and then the morning in the van they'll be like so did you get your painting done and i go oh yeah so i'll take out my phone and show them photos and they're like holy shit you did that in your room <laughs> <laughs> it's not what they thought at all and then they start asking me questions about it and they pass it around the van and it's you know i haven't had any weird reactions they're all like this is really cool it's like good genuine reactions eh yeah yeah all right so that that's yeah that is so cool you can do that and yeah, I mean, yeah, you're always finding a workaround in modeling, and that, that that's probably one of the best one, best ones I've seen. Yeah, that is that is really cool. <laughs> Facts. All right, uh, Garrison, would you like to do the next question? Uh, yes. So we just did uh, number three. So, what is the attraction to building dioramas? So, growing up, I loved war films. I loved films with a good story and you know the era i'm quite a bit older than you boys so <laughs> but the era <laughs> I was like you know longest day and Battle yeah. of the bulge and all those things so i loved you know a good historical story so when i started building again and i did this one uh panther and i had to put it in a story i had to put build a little diorama i had to make a story and um, so I started looking on the internet for figures and stuff and found um, these are really old, horrible Tamiya figures, but there's a German infantry at rest where they're having a meal, they're eating and having bread and all that kind of stuff. Uh. I got that. And then I came across uh, Tamiya's American assault infantry. And I looked at that and immediately thought of saving Private Ryan. So straight away, my imagination started going. And I think that's the one bit I really enjoy is coming up with the ideas and um, I'll get inspiration from lots of different sources. It could be from seeing a movie or just seeing some figures in a good pose or a vehicle. I've always wanted to do something with, or I've just read a book about a certain battle or a certain unit. Um, I, for example, I've just read a book called uh, brothers in arms by um, it's been written by an American basketball player, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like all-time player. Um, and it's about the 761st Tank Battalion, we were an all-black tank battalion. Um, Morgan Freeman just did a documentary last week that was released on um, History Channel. But, you know, I heard that and I read the book, I have to build a diorama. So that's one that's going to happen soon. But nice. going back to this first one, it was um, Saving Private Ryan. And I thought, well, I'm not going to do a scene from the film. I'm going to do a scene from between the Normandy landing and then going off to look for Private Ryan. So it was like a little scene in between where this German crew were hanging out and starting the engine on their Panther and having breakfast. And the captain and his boys were about to burst through this, this wall <laughs> and take them out. So I just love stories and, you know, I, I love seeing people's bills at competitions and seeing vehicles and stuff, but I love, I always gravitate towards the dioramas. I want a story. I want to see these vehicles and the soldiers and so on in their natural environment. I think it's I just, for me, it's just way more interesting. I would, uh, I would 100% agree with you there, Martin. That's, I would yeah, say that's my favorite part of modeling too. Well. <laughs> yes, yes. The the whole story and the imagination and it's like like on my Instagram I, I have recreating history with plastic and glue. It's like you're telling a yeah. story, right? That's that's totally it. That's totally it, recreating history. And you know, growing up in the UK, um, you hear all about the war in the Western Front and that's that's always the emphasis bit of North Africa, a bit of Italy, maybe. But as much as I knew and learned and loved reading about World War II, I never really got into the Eastern Front. It was just not even talked about. So since I've gone back 
come back to modeling, it's one area that I've done quite a bit of reading in and watching podcasts and listening to podcasts and watching videos and so on. And, you know, that whole theater is just to me mind blowing. It makes oh, yes. what happened in Europe look like a punch up in a pub. It's mm. just the numbers are crazy. So I've been doing quite a few Russian dioramas as well. And then because of my, again, because of my age and I was around just as a kid when it happened, I had an interest in Vietnam. So I've done quite a few Vietnam dioramas too. Cause it's, to me, that's living history. That's when I was around. Yeah. It's like the equivalent for us in the Ukrainian conflict for us youngins. You know, it's, uh, yeah. There's a lot of um, dioramas coming out of that. Mainly, you know, farmers dragging away destroyed tank uh tank <laughs> like, that, which is, like we we started the podcast just as basically like the same week or like two weeks that that conflict started roughly a eh, garrison i think so yeah it was, it was right after we, russia really pushed into ukraine is when we all started kind of getting together yeah because <laughs> that, that that's when all the the tanks were being dragged off and all of that yeah. and, and we also swore well, that's on why it. We have to have more tractors aren't they <laughs> yeah. I, I was sitting there going there's got someone is going to going to be there's going to be a, a kit a dual kit of a t62 or t64 <laughs> and a tractor in it there is someone's yeah. going to do it eventually and you know the whole yeah. coke page thing and stuff like that there's there, there been some really good dioramas of that but well ironically in that first episode we before we recorded we were saying to each other right this has just started all that don't talk about it. Let's not try and talk about it. And then we spent about half yeah. an hour talking about it. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we we got one of your dioramas on the screen at the moment. It's your this one's based off uh, what was it, Garrison? Um, and Eastern Day. Front. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. So you got the KV one and stuff like that. So um, it is it is an amazing diorama. It's so well detailed. How long did that one take you to make? out of curiosity okay so that took me um just under a month holy oh. fuck yeah i i build quickly <clears throat> and it happened from when i was a kid i used to build you know i do a complete kit start to finish um over a weekend you know and that was with enamel paint so i'm holding this thing it's part, not even fully dried and i'm still painting colors <laughs> <on it. laughs> And then I would then I would completely cover them in in um, gloss varnish that I could play with them, but um, yeah, I've always been fairly quick, and and I think now as well because of the planning and the thinking about it, I have a clear mental picture of exactly what I want, and I've been able to transfer that to my build, usually pretty pretty accurately to what I imagined. And this came about because I had recently watched the movie Enemy at the Gates. Great movie. And I did some reading yep. about it. Yeah. And um, the Zaitsev character obviously did exist. There wasn't really a duel between him and any major Koenig. Um, his girlfriend in real life was actually another sniper. And the fascinating thing that happened was that she and he got injured separately, seriously, and both thought the other was dead. And then fast forward 60 years, and this journalist is interviewing her and says something to her, and she says, how could you possibly know that? And he said, oh, well, Zaisev told me. And she said, impossible, he's dead. And he said, no, I saw him last week. <laughs> and then they were able to meet up like 60 years later and she apparently is still alive she's 102 wow holy shit yeah but for this diorama i wanted to build a kv1 tank again another movie i'd seen was um one called tank a russian one i think it's on amazon prime good movie about uh t-34 crews taking the piss out of a kv1 crew because they had this knackered old beast um, and then leaving them just to guard the flank. Well, it turns out that the Germans came via the flank and this tank knocked out 14 or 15 Panther 3s and 4s <laughs> and was hero of the occasion. Um, and to me, it is the ultimate brute of a tank. It's just a big hulking machine. 
Um, so I wanted to, so that's when I started doing some research and found out that there were some at the beginning of the Battle of Stalingrad before they all got knocked out. Um, and I wanted to do a wrecked tank. So this was also the first time that I'd used much in the way of photo etch because I had to do that for the fenders to just get them destroyed. Um, I love using resin for the water. I found um, a Zeitzer figure online from this random little company. Um, the figure of the female sniper is um, young miniatures. And then, again, just scouring the internet, I found um, a set of Germans at Stalingrad who were running through the rubble um, and who have one of those um, cable-laying backpacks. Oh, the signal cord. You see them in the movie. Yeah. So you see them in the movie knocking those guys off first. So I have them running across a gap. Now, one of the things that I had to take into account is what they call compression. If I had had a realistic distance from the sniper to his targets, this diorama would have been seven feet long. So you have to suspend reality sometimes to get it compressed into a small space. So obviously, I mean, right now, if you look at it, he's, he's close enough to throw the rifle and hit him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you have to um, suspend reality sometimes. Yeah, although in Stalingrad, that Stalingrad, this sort of distance is actually not beyond reality. To be honest, they did a yeah. that was an incredibly close hand to hand sort of combat fighting and yeah, um, yeah. horrific. I mean, I've just finished uh, reading Blood Red Snow. Oh, and, it's a good book. Oh, it was such a good book, and there's not enough money in the world to get me to go through what he did. Um, yeah. So just, this, so this KV one you did, is this based off a photo? like a historical photo or is it just one that you just went ham on? I, um, I actually actually found a few reference pictures of knocked out tanks, knocked out, and it was kind of an amalgamation of several of them um, to get the effect. That's, that's something I love about like diorama creators like yourself, Martin, you take a historical event and then you just make it your own and it may not be a, a said picture, but it, it tells a story so well. And it's so yeah. detailed. So you've touched on it a bit, a little bit, um, but just wondering if you could expand on the process of building a diorama from like uh, when you have an idea to like how you sort of map out what you're going to do with it, and you know, like how how do you start from like zero of you have a model kit to like having a diorama? Because we okay. we all have different processes for building stuff, and uh, so like, how do you get from A to B and stuff like that? Well, a, weirdly, normally happens in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and I'm swilling around in my head. And while I'm in the shower, I don't know why it happens there. I just got tired to think. Um, they kind of formulate into a mental picture. And I start to, in my head, have a picture of exactly what it is that I want to do. Um, what the scene is going to be what figures I'm going to use. Um, <laughs> and then I grab my waterproof phone and start. So basically I then start to look for figures that fit what I want. I've already got in my head what vehicles I want and the scene. Um, the next step is I usually will draw it out. Just, you know, super basic drawing, just a plan view of the layout and possible size of it. Um, from doing that very first um, Saving Private Ryan one, which was two foot by two foot, ridiculous, I realized that I had to condense things quite a bit. So it can be hard if you want to show both sides, both competence. It's quite hard to fit that into a small enough space not to be yes. too hard to, con you know, to move around. So... Quite often, it'll just be one side. Or if I want to get both in, um, like the picture you've got is of a Tiger One uh, just passing a building in Budapest, in the siege of Budapest. Um, I'll, I'll have an ambush, for example. That way I can get figures pretty close together and it not be a problem. Which is amazing, in my opinion. I, I just, it, It's great to see other people with that same mindset wanting to, to bring it all together. I know Garrison got uh, flack from someone for his uh, Vietnam 
ambush diorama. You oh. remember with the uh, VC popping out of the uh, spider holes and stuff? <laughs> yeah, there was... Uh, Martin, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but I made this uh, Vietnam diorama, and it's uh, an M113 at this Y intersection uh, getting ambushed. And, you know, they're yeah. popping smoke, and guys running up. You have seen that one? Yeah. Do you remember the spider hole on the left-hand side of the M113 where that guy's coming out? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. When I took that to IPMS Phoenix, uh, I had a couple, two people tell me that <laughs> that that's unrealistic and an ambush would never be that close. And keep in mind, one, not only am I building a diorama of warfare, two, I, I was currently in the infantry at the time. So <laughs> uh, it's like, all right, man, you're, you're kind of goofy, but OK, sure. <laughs> it's Vietnam, bro. It's <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some of the things that people say to you is like do i even need to waste breath to respond or yes do I just let <laughs> it's like <laughs> jesus christ so i did a vietnam one um and it was called i called it broken down and it was an m113 again and it was broken down by the side of a river mm. and um it was 101st airborne troopers and you could see their badges and I'd said in my blurb that they, you know, you can see how knackered they are and war weary and thousand yard stare. They'd just come back from Hamburger Hill and blah, blah, blah. And this guy writes in and goes, um, just so you know, uh, the 101st Airborne weren't at Hamburger Hill. And I'm like, dude, I just watched the movie. I just watched the movie. It was all 101st Airborne. You should have told him Google's free. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes, okay then, but but they never used armoured vehicles. I went, the decal set I got is called M113s of the Airborne Forces in Vietnam. Okay? It's like... Fucking Christ. <laughs> you just want to uh, and just slap them. <laughs> oh, it does. Man, it, it So, a quick story, and then I've, I've got a question about the dioramas. Uh, yeah. I did an AAV commission build a while <laughs> back, and it's got a Marine <laughs> washing off an <laughs> AAV. Right? I love this one. I yeah. love this and, one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, and this was – I was still in the Marine Corps at the time, and I had done commission builds for this lady before. Her husband and son were both AAV crew members, and this yeah. one was for her son. And it was supposed to be her son washing off his AAV while he's texting his friend. So I made the AAV absolutely covered in mud. Not too bad. It's got some dust and mud. Um, and it's it's kind of clean on the spot. It's washing. But I took that to IPMS San Diego. And one of the head guys walked up to me. And he was like, because I entered it into a contest. He was like, hey, I want to let you know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a neat little scene. But vehicles don't get that dirty. And I, I just kind of stared at him flabbergasted thinking two weeks ago I was in the field and I watched <laughs> one of these drive by and it was twice as dirty as what I made. I just kind of yeah. stared at him thinking what kind of nonce – it's a vehicle that goes from water to land. It doesn't yeah. get clean. It gets yeah. dirt. I was like, holy shit, this guy is uh, – <laughs> this is fucking wild. It's, it's just, and you know, sometimes I will bother to look at the person's profile, and nine times out of ten, it either says single or divorced. And I'm like, I can tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking accurate. Oh, God. Yeah. There was a, when I first got in the hobby, I, I did a 114 Tiger Tank in Normandy. And uh -huh. it's I tried making it historically accurate, the tank itself, it didn't work. But uh, this guy commented on Facebook, he was like, There were no tiger tanks in Normandy. Oh, and I was gosh. like I, I, I Google searched, were there tiger tanks in Normandy? It took a screenshot and just replied with that. <laughs> I was like, You stupid yeah. imbecile. It's, it's the internet is free. I oh. know. <laughs> Please use it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So so with dioramas, Martin. Yeah, obviously, you know, you talked about the, the, the beginning stages and whatnot. So when you sit down, you, you've got your drawing set, um, you know, let's go into materials. What kind of materials do you use for your bases uh, and whatnot? 
most of the time I use XPS foam, you know, the pink insulation foam. Yeah. I use that as my base. Um, it's easy to cut, to shape, to glue bits on. And then if I need on top of that, if I need any kind of earth surface, quite often I'll use um, plaster of Paris. I mean, you can get a big container for about $4. It's really cheap. It's really easy to use. Stick on a pair of rubber gloves, you know, get it all all sculpted and, and it dries super fast as well. So you need to definitely have in your mind and have things set where they're going to be. Then to cover that up, I usually use a rattle can. I have a bunch of rattle cans um, just to get a base color so nothing white shows through. Now, I make sure that I spray from the top so that the paint is just hitting the plaster and not the sidewalls of the foam. Oh, yes. Because, <laughs> yeah, I discovered the hard way. So <laughs> if you spray too close to foam, it melts. It turns into marshmallow. Yes, it does. Um, and it's not, it's not actually the paint, it's the propellant. So if you stand far enough away, you can spray it fine. But you can also buy, you know, foam-friendly spray cans as well. But, um, yeah, so I spray the top. And then um, I started collecting um, used coffee grounds when I made my wife coffee in the mornings. So I'd save the bag in the evening, put it in a tray, stick it outside, let it dry out. And then she discovered that some of the supermarkets give away from their machines complete bags of used coffee grounds for people to use for their gardens. So she just oh. picked up a couple of bags free for me. And what I will then do is spray the area with um, IPA, you know, alcohol, a few puffs with that. Then I will sprinkle out the uh, coffee grounds and then dilute um white glue 50 50 with water and then drip that on because the alcohol if you spray that again on top it uh, breaks down the surface tension so the stuff just soaks in and just leave it for a day and that's absolutely rock hard um mm. and that's good if i want that color finish if i want a dark surface um if i want something more desert or dry then i'll use grout just go to home depot and I'll tell you a funny story. I was in Home Depot, not in Home Depot, in Lowe's with my wife. And uh, she was looking for household stuff. And I was looking around and, and saw this stuff on the floor in the corner. It was like a pile of grout. So I got a piece of cardboard and I start scooping it in. This is completely <laughs> embarrassing. And this worker walks up to me and goes, what are you doing? <laughs> I went, oh, um... <laughs> I'm just collecting this stuff. I build dioramas and it'd be great for a surface. And he says, really? He says, you got any pictures? And I went, well, yeah. And I started showing him pictures. He was an ex-serviceman. And he's like, oh. oh, that's really cool. Yeah, hold on a minute. <laughs> and he goes away. And he goes back with his manager and he goes, show him the pictures. And I show him to him. And he goes, okay, I'll be right back. And he comes back with a bag of grout that's been returned. There was a hole in the top. Nick gives me this five pound bag of grout. Like, there you go. So I'm set Dude. for grout for the rest of my life. Then. Uh, yeah, no kidding. So yeah, you, maybe I should go to Lowe's and start looking at the grout section. <laughs> maybe <laughs> spill a bag on my own. <laughs> my luck. And then the rest of the scene. Will Hold on, on the yeah, the rest of the scene will depend on what I'm trying to achieve. The picture that you've got on the screen is um, a city street, and that XPS foam is really good for carving on. Um, and what you do is you use a, a sharp kind of a hobby knife, and you'll carve your lines, and then take like a wooden skewer or toothpick and run it along them just to widen them. Um, and that gives you good indentations. Um, when I first did that Private Rhyme one, I actually, another way to do it is to take a pencil that's got an eraser on the end, take mm -hmm. the eraser out and square it off, and then you've got a punch, and you can do it that way. And then oh. another thing to do is to take um, kitchen foil, roll it up in a ball, and then yes. roll that across the top, and then that'll give it some texture. And so it's, 
it's really good for catching when you do dry brushing. You've got some detail there. Yes. Oh man, that's what 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 do you use for whenever you finish your bricks and you uh-huh. you grout the brick lines? Is it just the grout you use? Is that it, or do you use like dirt or? Yeah, I use the same grout um, and just have it a wet mix of it, and then wipe it afterwards, and that fill it in. You, as long as you make sure that you've got those grooves deep enough. Right. Right. And then you can't go wrong with colors. I'll, and I'll use rattle cans. I'll use grays and browns and different shades of both of those and just randomly spray them. And quite often I'll do it. I mean, most of the time I do a base, it's done in a few hours. And I'll spray them and, and I'll spray them while they're still wet and they kind of blend. Yeah, I did that with, uh, I think, my the, the Elfdorf diorama. I started uh, painting those and they just kind of blended together while they were still wet. Yeah, yeah, that was because I, I used to wait until they were all dry, you know. Yeah, and I, I think get that separation. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that blending, that yeah. What about uh, let's see, what what do you use for your glass, like your, on your doors and windows? Okay, so I looked online and I found a company that sold the glass slides that you use for microscopes. And this glass is absolutely wafer thin, incredibly thin. And you can mm. break it between your fingers and not have any glass splinters in you or anything. Really? Um, or you can just lay it down and just press on it and it just snaps. Um, and a little container about the size, I think, how big? Like an inch square. It's got something like 300 in there. And it will cost you less than $10. No kidding. Yeah. And it's perfect glass because it's scale thickness. It's super, super thin. It's unbelievably thin. Man, I, I've been using uh, like clear printing paper or whatever, like uh, laminating paper. And it's yeah. just, it's so thick and hard to use. I'm going to have to try that that micro glass you're talking about. Yeah, it's really good. And it is, it's totally scale thickness because it's so thin. Oh man. Yeah. I got to get me some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just know Garrison's going to re-listen to this episode multiple times just to write down <laughs> notes. Like it's like, what are you oh, saying? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Shit. Hey, like the ground. Like, man, like during just this segment, uh, I've Googled plastic Paris, which I've got, thankfully. I, I Googled <laughs> grout. I don't have that yet. Uh, and then the glass, because I I always use I get dirt from outside and I blend it up in a blender. Yeah. And uh, yeah. hey, this this blender is just for dirt, by the way. We don't put food in it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an old blender from the early two thousands. So yeah, it's uh, yeah. and so I get that and I'll glue it on with like the diluted PVA glue and uh, yeah, and then I'll like paint it whatever color I want with an airbrush or like you said rattle cans or whatever, but. That that plastic cool. uh, that plastic Paris and grout man, I'm gonna have to. <sighs> yeah, that's fuck. And the whole, I mean, I've I've never been able to relate to somebody who says like trying to fit a whole scene that that could be like the size of a two foot by six foot table into like this yeah. like two foot area and fuck like that was the Normandy diorama I'm working on right now is a perfect example yeah. trying yeah. to show that recon patrol ambushing a puma in the hedgerows is like yeah. fuck how do i do this and make it realistic <laughs> yeah. it's a challenge it is but it's a fun challenge yeah yeah it definitely is oh man yeah that's mm. callum what questions do you got for him on this uh i'd say like we um so when you when you get an idea for a uh, diorama, do you immediately start looking for any sort of reference of what you can find around the area? Like, what what's your go to uh, for that? So, so yeah, so for vehicles, I go straight to Google and see if I can find not just find the vehicle, but find it in a similar situation. Um, also, I've watched, you know, when I'm modeling, I'll have YouTube on, and especially in the hotels and YouTube channels, and I'll sometimes stop it and take a screenshot, just take a picture of the TV screen for something that I've seen happening that would work or can help me in another diorama. Um, You know, things like 
stowage, putting stowage on vehicles. And it was something as a kid I never thought about. I'd build, I'd see, you know, things on World War II and knew about the tanks and knew what they were called and what they looked like. But no one ever used to show pictures of them with stuff on them or on the model kits. The model kits never came with, they didn't do stowage. Right. So this was something when I started back, just blew my mind that these things were laden down like gypsy caravans <laughs> and everywhere. Like you look at an M3 half track, you can barely see the vehicle. Yeah. You know, there's so much. <laughs> the that's, that's something that I found so intriguing. Uh, being in the infantry, seeing all these different vehicles, like main packs, day packs, medical packs, MRE boxes, fucking the occasional cooler. It's like, oh, I want to recreate <laughs> that. Like every time yeah, I do a diorama, really yeah, it, you know, it's, every time you do a diorama or a vehicle, I think of like, okay, if I was the the VC or a troop on this Vic, what would I put on it for this scenario? Yeah. And it's like uh, the Afghanistan diorama I did with the LAV 25, I put a yeah. uh, a sea bag. I painted duct tape on there and put IED marking kit because <laughs> like a nice. year before then we did IED training and that's what we did. We carried all of our IED marking stuff in a sea bag. And so getting right. that just adds that personal touch and makes it just that much better. It, it's all those little details to me that make a diorama. I yes. love that stuff. Absolutely. Totally love that. You know, having a, a water bottle there or a teapot or a, a bike on the back or like I went through a phase where every single armor piece I did, I would put pinup posters inside. Same. And <laughs> the one you've got on the screen of my of that tiger, if you look mm -hmm. in the top, you can see next to the loader is a pinup. Is it a good pinup? That's the question. It's a good pinup. It's it's yes. it's, it's year appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh fun heavens! Which is is looking up pinups from the forties or pinups from the sixties or you know, and then yes. having to explain to the wife your uh, suit history. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's I. I remember the first time I was out in my garage and I had my headphones on and I was looking up. Uh, I Google search 1940s pinup, and, and my wife walked up behind me. And she tapped me on the shoulder, scared the shit out of me. She was like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Oh, I, I swear to God, it's not what it looks like." I'm doing research. <laughs> it's part of the process. Get over it. Oh <laughs> uh, no, she got a kick out of it though. It was, it was all good. Uh, so Martin, is there? Do you work on just one diorama at a time, or are you like me, where I have about multiple build, like four builds on my desk staring at me? I so could... used to do, I used to purely do one build at a time, and that carried on until I started doing the hotel building. Mm -hmm. And the reason it changed was because every build that I do in a hotel will get to a point where it's too fragile, or I have to put assemblies together so it can't travel anymore so at that point that becomes an at-home build and then the next one for the road goes away so i will have two or three on the go now right now i've got um a battle of the bulge diorama that you know is several several months away from getting done but it has a lot of figures so anytime i'm going away and I don't have any current big build on the go. I'll just take a bunch of the figures and do a few more. So chipping away at a big build by doing little bits and kind of bite-sized pieces instead of trying to do 40 figures all in one go. Oh, yes. Get yourself burnt out doing that too. Oh, yeah. And that's the nice thing about dioramas is it's much easier to sidestep the loss of mojo or getting burnt out because you switch tack. You know, yes. if you're getting off with a complicated vehicle construction i'll just do some figures or i'll go and work on the base or it's like starting a different kit but it's part of the same project so you're still moving it forward that's the uh the beautiful thing about dioramas yeah that yeah it's probably that's one of the reasons i'm starting to make 
a few more bases. I'm not I'm not that good at making bases and stuff like that, so I've avoid, I've kind of avoided them a little bit. But I've recently fa- been finding myself stuck on builds of you don't have the right paint to paint stuff, or you don't have this that, or it's just you sit there going, I've spent too long on this, and it's going nowhere. I can't look at it, sort of thing. And I had I yeah. had, I mean I had that say Friday night when I had the house to myself, and I'm sitting going. I need to get this painted and this painted, but I don't have this. Uh, my airbrush is backfiring on itself and needs replacing. I can't work on that. But I've got this free time to do something. And, you know, especially when, you know, for me, it's trying to trying to get that free time of sitting down. And I've got this time to do something. You, you really don't want to waste it, <clears throat> as we were talking yeah. before about, you know, being in hotels and all that. And I was getting stressed going, I need to do something. I need to work on something or just show, you know, I've got this time. I need something. And eventually I ended up making a very, very, very simple base for a Sopworth Camel that we'll yeah. see later on in the episode. And it literally just took me about an hour to knock together. And I mean, it's, yeah. you know, as basic as anything, but it was something that I, I wanted to do for the Camel. And it, I just, it just gave me an excuse to make something that was fresh. It was brand new and, you know, just use my time use whatever valuable time I have to do something it may, yeah. does make you feel I felt so much better. I was like, okay, I've made something, the models on it, all it. that. Yeah. I, I did a, at nationals. I went to a workshop that was run by Rick Lawler, who does the propaganda channel. Brilliant, mm-hmm. brilliant modeler. And he, um, his, his, um, workshop was on diorama bases and, we had met in the hall like the day before and he says, yeah, I wanted to see some of your work and I've seen your stuff online and he's looking at it and he looked at me and he goes, why are you coming to the seminar? <laughs> and I said, well, you can always learn more. And <laughs> this seminar was four hours and he was trying to get people to make a base in that time. Well, I brought some figures with me. I did a base and a scene and I started on the second base and there was something <laughs> like a quarter of way through their first one. But you get into a habit, you get into a way of doing things and stuff that you know works and it can be surprisingly quick. Like I'll knock together a base for this uh, macabre that I'm doing. It'll take me an hour and, and it's perfectly acceptable base just by using the process that I explained. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think like, um, when people start dioramas, they can be a little bit intimidating in a way. Oh, yeah. just just because there's a lot in it, and um, that like that's personally that's what I've found sometimes is just you see something like even Garrison does, and it's like how I'm, I'm not sure how to do that, and yeah, you know, so I keep everything simple that I know. But there's even still that sort of like how do I get this thing to look realistic or to do that, and it, uh, I mean it is just down to a bit of research and a bit of intuition and a bit of just time and practice really yeah and, and taking it taking it in small steps yeah because yeah. if you look at finished dioramas you look at them and go well there's no way i could do that that's ridiculous there's so much stuff there but it didn't start like that it started in little bits and yep. if you kind of portion it off into manageable bite-sized bits you can get each of those done, and then you keep coming back to it and thinking, "Oh yeah, I could add this, I could add that," and it's a work in, pro- in process. You just keep bringing stuff back, keep adding little bits. You know, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. If you if if you feel intimidated, that is the best way. Completely agree. Step by step, you can't climb yeah. a mountain without taking a lot of little steps. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, that was. That was really, that was interesting. That was really cool. So <laughs> we'll move on for the... Uh... Surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I sound surprised. No, that was... <laughs> yeah. I I think uh, Garrison and I actually learned a lot from that. I'm going to, like, this episode alone, I'm, I'm going to take on a lot of info and take that plunge into something, so... Cool. All well, right. Keep me posted. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So we'll go on to the next question. Uh, if my screen would like to uh, cooperate. Uh, Garrison, you're up. All right. Well, (laughs) Mr. Martin, question number six. What is your favorite part of modeling? Ooh, favorite parts. Um, Your all-time favorite. (laughs) There's a a point with every build for me 
where it goes from being, mm, yeah, to, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yes. That's why it is. And that is, like, I go back to this macabre that I'm building at the, at the moment. That's where I just got to that tonight. It was um, glossy because I was using, doing pin washes and stuff and didn't look realistic. One layer of matte varnish over the whole thing, and now it looks like a real tank. Mm. Um the diorama that you've got on screen is um, an LSSC. It's um, a light seal support craft, and it's a rescue diorama with three seals being picked up by this rescue boat. And with a diorama like that, I had in my head exactly what I wanted and painted the figures. And once I had got the boat on there and then poured the resin, that's it. That's the moment. This has come together. It's going to be as I imagined it. And and as a diorama maker, that is the moment for me. Not even when I finished it. When I finished it, it's realized what I'd imagined. But it's that transition point when it goes from being eh, just something I'm working on, not sure how it's going, to that's it. That's what I wanted. That's my favorite bit. Beautiful. Love it. All right, so <clears throat> another uh, another question we've got for you. So this is talking about the Nationals that you've just been at. So how was it at the Nationals when you gave your cinema, like the, your seminar? Yeah. Far out, I cannot pronounce things. Yes, um, <laughs> you got it, Callum. You got it, buddy. I haven't even had a drink today yet. <laughs> um, but um, how, yeah. so how, how was, how was uh, giving a presentation? Um, yeah, it, it seemed like you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, so so basically what happened was I got contacted by John Bonani and he said, um, I'm looking, I'm arranging the seminars for nationals. How would you like to do one? And I was uh, I was surprised that he asked me because, you know, you guys know I haven't been doing this that long. It's three years. Um, and I said, are you sure? And he says, yeah, definitely. You've got a lot to give people because – you have progressed a long way in a short time and people want to know how. Um, and the last time, I mean, I'm not put off by speaking publicly. I mean, I know a lot of people are, but um, as a snowboard instructor, I was a snowboard trainer as well. So I would regularly run instructor training sessions and have to lecture to, you know, 40, 50 people. Not as many as were at nationals. That was a lot more. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that aspect didn't bother me too much, but it was just whether I had enough content. And once I started roughing out this seminar and slides, I realized I actually had to cut stuff down, that I had more than enough to say. <laughs> and, um, it That's was a good just, problem to have. Yeah, yeah. I had, yeah. And the, it went well enough that they asked me if I'd like to do it, ne- do another one next year. So it kind of oh, yeah. Well. Um, I have actually put it on my YouTube channel now. So if, if anybody does want to listen to me rambling on about dioramas, it's it's on there. Um, but yeah, it was really well received and people kept coming up to me afterwards and asking me more questions and saying how much they enjoyed it or they posted online and said how much they enjoyed it. Um, really weird for me, though, was two years before I went to the Vegas Nationals as a spectator, I had just started back modeling heard about these nationals, thought with my flight benefits, I can just nip in and nip out for one day and just have a look and see what it's about. Um, I had never at that point seen another model by anybody else. Mm. Uh, So it was a, it was a a real eye opener. Um, And it was encouraging, but also it was like, holy shit, these people are good. Intimidating. um, Sure. Yeah, it was intimidating. The other thing was, though, I didn't get a very nice welcome from two or three people initially, which kind of put me off to the point where I was thinking, you know what, fuck them, I'll just model at home and do my own thing and not have anything to do with it. And then I met a bunch of nice people. I met Steve Munsell from Value Gear, um, the guy from Monroe Purdue, and then the Plastic Posse crowd. And they were all super nice and super welcoming. And I was like, okay, there's some cool people. This is good. I'll stay. And then next year was Omaha. And I competed at that. And so it was a whole different scene. 
knew a lot more people, had gone to my local clubs, so some of those people were there. <coughs> and it was a different experience again. And then this time, um, I have my own YouTube modeling page, which I have quite a lot of subscribers now. And people were coming up to me and asking if they could have their picture taken with me. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> you can me with someone else. Not that there's anyone else to confuse me with. But, but yeah, it was very, very different. Um, and consequently, there were, the seminar was full. It was, um, it was a nice surprise. Wow. That's uh, with how short of time you've been back into the hobby, man. It's really great to see a, a success story like this. You know, you love what Thanks. you do. You're damn good at it. And people recognize it and appreciate it. Yeah. It's been nice. It's been nice. Not what I expected. <laughs> My wife bought me that. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you, you start off just doing a hobby, just, just for the enjoyment of it next thing you know yeah you got all of that going for you so i mean i am i will admit i am slightly envious because you and i basically started back in modeling around the same time um <clears throat> you, if you can tell that um but <laughs> <laughs> although that's definitely something that you'd you'd learn to just not worry about that kind of stuff anyway no. but um so I know you've done a, like, you've won the podcast with, uh, there's so many now, I'm getting all the names confused. Spruce Cutters. Pardon? Spruce Cutters. Yep, that's the one, that's the one. Um, do you get any other, any, any of the others um, hitting you up? I mean, we were, yeah, I, was, I was kind of surprised that you accepted our one, to be honest, but. Um, <laughs> 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 the insanity guys said that they need to have me on and, um Scott Gentry said, yeah, we need to have you on here sometime. But I mean, I don't want people to get bored with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I imagine but, trying to like, organize something like that with your work and all that is a little bit of a ball itch. Um, yeah. But I mean, you guys, I mean, I, I, I heard about, well, I know it's a question you've got later on, but I, I came across your podcast and just kept listening to it. And it was fun and I enjoyed it. And then, when you said, oh, would you like to be on? It was like, yeah, why not? <laughs> well, we're very, we are very grateful. So, yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm very honored. So. <laughs> All right. Shall we, we'll move on to question eight. So what is your favorite era, genre, subject to build? I mean, we'll, we've seen that you've done quite a few things, uh, including a very interesting sci-fi tank. I can't yeah. remember what it's called, <laughs> that, that, that thing. Uh, yeah. But what what is what is the the one that you prefer the most? I would say World War Two without without question, and that's purely because, as I said, growing up like most people watching war films, um, I joined the Air Cadets, like Junior Air Force Air Training Corps, um, when I was thirteen, fourteen. Um, so I used to go to RAF bases, and you know, Britain was a huge thing, and so I was always had a big interest in World War II and it was the, it was the period that I used to read up about and learn about and always has my, my main interest. Um, and as I said, since um, coming back to the hobby, a whole new genre, the whole Eastern Front thing has opened up to me. Um, so it's like I'm learning everything from new. It's a whole new bunch of stuff that I'm learning about. Again, the Pacific too, in the UK, you tend to be quite focused on, not just on World War II, but on the British aspect of it and less attention. I suppose everyone's nationalistic. You know, in the States, you know, people are more focused on um, Pacific and stuff. And Russians, of course, there wasn't any other part of the war as far as they were concerned. So um, <laughs> it was, it's been a whole... So it's not, it's not, it's something that never got stale for me because I'm learning all the time. And there's, I'm just mind blown by the amount of information that there is coming to light that's new about World War II. You know, when they open up more libraries or more archives and stuff that we thought was kind of written in stone is completely wrong mm. um, since they've discovered documents and more interviews and, and all that kind of stuff. 
But as far as eras go, I don't like to just stick to one. Um, you mentioned that uh, sci-fi tank. Well, it was just, again, that's me just browsing through the internet. And um, someone had uh, our club, the Apocalypse Tank. That's with the, the one, double, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I saw that, and I had been interested in it and thought, well, that'd be cool to build. It'd be fun to weather. And then I saw a guy at the club built one, and he built it so well. I'm thinking, well, I can't build it any better than that, and I don't know what I'd do with it. And while looking online, I came across the Bandai tank, which is an absolute beast. The turret looks like it came off a World War II battleship. The thing is massive. And um, I just wanted to build it. I just immediately captivated by this thing. And that's the reason I built the Macava now, because it reminds me of, of that so much. <laughs> <laughs> but then, you know, other periods, I, I like to try and keep things fresh and, and although world war ii is my favorite genre i tend not to build two things from the same genre in a row i'll try and space it up so like right now i'm building a modern tank with a little scene the next thing i might do might be world war ii the thing i did before this was a gundam the thing i did before that was a yag panther you know the thing i did before that was working on that um diorama with the future tank so, again, it's another way I find to sidestep loss of mojo or loss of interest. You know, if, if I were to build a German tank that was you know, the tricolor camouflage and then immediately do another one, I'd get hacked off. You know? Right. Just, yeah, just yeah. change things. Uh, okay. So would, uh, would something like, uh, say, World War I be something in the future? So, yeah. So... Again, just looking online and seeing vehicles, the the big rhomboid-shaped tanks are cool, but they didn't excite me that much. I mean, I've seen some beautifully done ones, but um, I saw the Whippet, which, again, until I started back modeling, I just thought every World War I tank looked like a rhomboid. <laughs> and I saw this and thought, that's pretty cool. I want to build a Whippet. So I've actually got one in my stash that I am going to build. And in terms of of doing something like that, I find it really hard. You can probably tell just to build a tank on its own. Right? <laughs> it ends up, Same. next thing is a vignette, next thing is a diorama, a vignette, next thing is a diorama and it just grows. But um, I do want to do some kind of World War I scene. And again, movies, just watching... 1917 again thinking mm. that would be cool to get some figures in there but it, it's a genre that's not completely been ignored but not had as much attention as it could have so there's not a huge choice of figures out there there's a company called tommy's war that does absolutely brilliant world war one figures but they're one thirty second scale ah, so you can't ah. put any <clears throat> vehicles or anything in there with them yeah yeah so that's think a bit of a yeah, I think ICM have been bringing out a few new ones. Like they've got yeah. like a German MG08 crew and stuff like that. But yeah, unfortunately, so, so there will be a, a World War One scene coming. <laughs> that is going to happen. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> is that your period? Pardon? Is that your period? Your job? Uh, I uh, my my main is sort of interwar. From World War One to World War Two, there. I mean, I like like all sorts. I like the eclectic stuff, the really weird, out there stuff. But if I can get something that's made between 1910 and 1940, that that's uh -huh. my sort of thing. I I I love the vehicles that you can see the progress progression of design. Yeah. Of what we get to nowadays, it's that that sort of they have an idea of what they want. Yeah. How do they execute so it? That's been my fascination. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, one area that has really interested me is is seeing some of the these kits in that period that you talk about that would never have been made, you know, 20 years ago. You look at all the Copper State armored cars. Oh, They're yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, those are great. So cool. And then uh, have you seen uh, a guy called Vargas Mog oh, yeah. Models? Yep. Yes. We've, we've been chatting yeah. with him. And yeah, yeah gonna... I mean, nobody else makes that stuff. And it and it's amazing. 
you know, a, a Matilda One or a, a Christie tank or some of the obscure Russian stuff. It's, you know, incredible. Yeah. The Vickers Mark One. Yeah, I I was looking at buying a couple, but I need to save up a bit. And also, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I've just made a rather large purchase as it is, so um, which people will see in a bit. But yeah. <laughs> There's one downside is usually that sort of stuff. It's just a bit on the more pricey side, but yeah, I mean, economies of scale. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So question nine, and this is a, an important one, if I can get my computer to work. So this is one that probably everyone gets asked all the time. What is your favorite modeling brand and why? Okay. So... When I started, well, when I was finishing just as a kid, just stopping modeling, I was just getting into Tamiya at the time. And so when I came back, it was the one brand that I definitely remembered and knew other than Airfix. Obviously, living in the UK, like 80% of what I built was Airfix. Um, well, that's just your paint drying duty, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Building Spitfires. I mean, yes, yes. <laughs> <lots of message. laughs> um, so I did start with Tamiya when I first came back, and they are they have a reputation for a reason. Their stuff is so well engineered um, and so well thought out, and not and, and not unnecessarily complicated. Um, I prefer painting and weathering to anything else. So the quicker I can get through construction, the happier I am. Agreed. But having said that, I have experimented with various brands and I'm not, um, I, I'm kind of brand agnostic. I will find the vehicle that I want. I'll see who does it. And then I will not get it until I have found a review on YouTube of not just an in-the-box review because that's they're not worth the price you pay. <laughs> but to see one built up, someone building one and going through one and reading reviews to find out what the best version of what I want is available and who makes it. So, you know, sitting in front of me, I've got a tack on kit. I haven't built very many, but it's pretty impressive. Um, Hobby Boss, Dragon, all the pictures you've got up, Meng, I've done one or two. Um, that giant tank was the first Bandai thing I did. You could have made three quarters of that without any glue. And it, that one is meant to be glued together. Um, and then since then, I've done a Gundam, which was ridiculous. I mean, you shake the box and it falls out. <laughs> yeah, those, uh, those Gundam kits are... Uh, when, when they have, like, elbows that have been moulded and they're bendable... Yeah, the sprue. That's that's ridiculous. I mean, that's why I should be taking away in hotel layovers. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, complete done. But yeah, so I don't stick to a particular brand, and some of the stuff that I do want is a bit older. And you know, as I was saying, that you know, having had forty years off, um, my criteria for what makes a good kit to build might be different from someone who's modeled all the way through and is used to how good kits are now. So I'm a lot easier to please. <laughs> like, for example, I just made a dragon Panther, and it had okay reviews online and I built it and it was like, well, this is great. I'm, this is, there's no problem here. This thing's nice to put together. And I know dragon have their critics and some of their older stuff can be a bit, ropey people dis itilary and you know to me they're a brand that does do a few obscure bits i'm on a budget i mean our daughter has just started in university and yeah Karen, you probably know over here that is an arm and a leg and a couple of mm. organs it's, it's oh yeah yes, yes yeah i need uh i need your liver right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> cough it well, up yeah <laughs> And Jump in the bathtub. I'm on a budget, so I'm, you know, if, if there's a dragon yag panther that's, you know, twenty five. I think I got it for twenty five dollars. Oh, and that's the a steal. Yeah, and the latest Meng one was 
you know, 60 or so. And I'm like, I'll look at the reviews and go, you know, it's not a horrible kit. I'm getting the $25 one. Yeah. You know, and it builds into a perfectly nice kit. So I don't, I think Tamiya probably, probably just about my favorite. And that's just from ease of construction and I can get to what I really want to quicker. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the stuff I like to do can be quite obscure. Recently, I got into some of the 1946 um, Wanderwaffe kind of German tanks just because I got into building some big tanks and these things were just the next step. You know, what could have happened if they'd had limitless money and time and weren't having the crap bombed out of them? Well, they could have built. <laughs> and people like Hobby Boss and Amusing Hobby, they're companies that have gone down that road and um, produced some really cool stuff. And this is my only really artistic outlet. And sometimes I find it can be boring if it's like, oh, well, it's a German tank. I've got to do it in tritone. That's it. But with this 1946 stuff, it's like, fuck it. All bets are off. You can do whatever you want. Yep. And if you want to have it, just having rolled out of a factory, didn't have time to paint with a red turret, you can do that. And I find it's quite liberating. And it's good practice for me, being relatively new to this all again, just experimenting, just trying different colors, different techniques, and it doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. To, to go to what you were saying about people saying dumbass things to you, I did this <laughs> tank. It was, it was supposed to be the, the final battle of Berlin in like 1947. They'd roll this thing out of the factory and been fighting with it. So the hull was red, primer red, and the turret was like a King Tiger turret and was camoed. And this guy posts on my page and goes, um, yes, it's quite nice, but you people and your red primer with an eye oh, in my God. <laughs> <laughs> the Germans would never have allowed one of those out the factory. They would have used all their gray paint first before they did that. I'm like, do I even waste my time replying? <laughs> <laughs> one, one World War II genre where you can do what you want. Someone's telling me it's wrong. <laughs> How dare you go off of non-historical facts of a non-historical battle? <laughs> yeah. I just, I think I just replied and said this vehicle did not exist. <laughs> <laughs> so that that that's why I reckon you should try. A uh, Horizon Island Defense Force build because you can yes. do whatever you want and you will piss off so many people online. <laughs> and, and that's the glorious thing about it. it it's a it's fictional. Fun. That's how yeah, it's fun, a, actually. <laughs> it, it's a fictional military from a video game. It's from a military simulator yeah. game, and it's just this backwater wannabe Fiji with Warsaw Pact and U.S. Cold War era stuff and modern. It's just uh, anything you want, man. Just. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> I, I love the idea. You know, I, I could definitely get into kit bashing for sure. Because yeah. I just see the pieces I've got in my spares box and, you know, a giant fuck off gun. And I'm like, let me put that on the hole. That would look cool. <laughs> <laughs> do, uh, yeah. do you remember the T62 I did from Tamiya? Uh, yeah, I remember you doing one. Yeah, that the that one is a Horizon Island Defense Force build. And I, uh, I threw a Challenger two side armor. I added steel plates. Yeah, like, I mean that's, it, that's, that's a fun cool thing about it. Spare bits and pieces. I'm definitely going to do some of that. Yeah, there was there was one kit bash I did as a kid that I'll never forget. On um, Saturdays, my dad used to go to a Chinese um, grocery. He'd bring me back a cooked crab. And I would sit oh. and eat this entire crab on my own while watching some war film. So <laughs> what I did was I kept the big shell and I hollowed it out, cleaned it out. I stuck part of a sprue in it, then used like DAS modeling clay to build a fuselage out of the underneath of it. Had some fins left from a spare phantom or something, stuck those on in like a V shape. Another bit of DAS over the top and made a, a fairing, and I had a spare P-51 cockpit, put that on top, and then I painted the thing. So I had this 
crab shaped spaceship. It was all my yeah. kit. <laughs> so, so that was my kit bashing. I need to do some more of that. That was fun. It, it is. It is good fun. That is a fact. Yeah, absolutely. Having no rules. Yeah. All right. So we'll get on to the final question, and this one's a little bit of uh, ego, but ego stroking, but. We don't care. Garrison, would you like? <laughs> All right. So uh, this is a Martin uh, research purposes. <clears throat> yes. Right. Uh, quality <laughs> control here. Uh, <laughs> how did you come across the MMP? And um, yeah, we'll, we'll stick with that for now. How did you come across the MMP? Okay. So what happened was I, I listened to all the podcasts. Um, and I find that they're all got something different to offer. They're all that little bit different to each other. No one's kind of covering the same ground. <coughs> so there's a lot of variety. And I was listening to Just Making Conversation, which I love because it's great to hear some British voices using phrases and things that are really familiar to me. And um, James was talking about a build that he was doing for a Battle of the Bulge group build. And it, my ears perked up. And he said, yeah, it was for uh, the guys over at Micro Machines podcast. Google, Google, Google. <laughs> and I find, I find you guys and I start listening thinking, this is another one that's different from all the others and is really cool. So I started listening at that point. And I was actually doing, and this is what I mean about making group builds work for you. I was just about to start a Battle of the Bulge diorama for another group build. And I thought, perfect timing. I will do that. Um, and that's when I start, that's how I came across you guys, just through just making conversation. And I'm pleased to hear that you're now getting mentioned on the um, on the website with all the podcasts on it. So that's cool. Yeah, I had to. That should help your list. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, ironically, uh, talking about that group build, you you won that one as well. <laughs> you yeah. did you did win that one <laughs> by, a, by a long margin when it came to judging we just been we basically sat down and went okay so we know who's won um, let's split out the rest <laughs> <laughs> uh. and that that build was from a photograph yeah that that was incredible yes. holy it's, crap that was uh, not cancer and and again talking about compression and stuff I wanted to to do that tank and the building behind it but you know in real life that would have been you know maybe 100 yards so i couldn't have that in my diorama so i filled it in with american vehicles in between and a, and a whole scene developed but yeah that's case in point you you built that quicker than i built mine and i mine was <laughs> a single vehicle <laughs> that was a month that it was three vehicles and I think about 16 figures. <laughs> That's a lot. I was saying, those, paint, those were all painted. Those figures were all painted on the road. Mm. Yeah, so. that, that was cool. So, I mean, we do we do try and be a little bit different from everyone else. Of course, we're, I think we're the only visual podcast out of them. Yeah. But our reasoning is it's a visual hobby, you know. It, so it totally, you can either totally. listen to it or you can watch it. So, you know. I mean, I'm not the best at uploading onto Spotify on time, but, you know, it's all good. <laughs> that's, uh, that's us passive-aggressively encouraging the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, yeah, we're, we're, we're glad you found us. and um, Me too. Yeah. If we don't have uh, Garrison, do you have any more questions before we close out to intermission? Uh, no. No, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the interview for Mr. Martin. And Mr. Martin, Thank do you, you have anything else to add? Anything you want to plug? Anything like that? Not really. Um, I've got a Facebook modeling page, uh, MD Scale Models. Um, same title on um, Instagram. And then on YouTube, it's just my name. It's just Martin Drayton. With, with my YouTube channel, I haven't put anything on there in about a year. I've been too busy building. Um, <laughs> What happened was um, I was used to using YouTube for other stuff that I did. And so when I built model, it just seemed natural just to stick it on there. So I did. Um, and I go through some of 
what I do and how I do it. It's all still photos. I don't, I didn't bother videoing. Um, and this do voiceover over the top. And I would like to present them as stories a lot of the time. So there'll be the whole setting, there'll be music and the whole deal. So have a look if you get bored. <laughs> I, um, I need to get back on there and, and do some more stuff, but it just keeps piling up how many I would have to get on there to stop putting. <laughs> well, as, uh, two, with, as two people who both have uh, YouTube channels, we, we, we know that. Um, hey, yeah, Garrison. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, that was uh, incredible. We're going to just um, have a brief intermission now, just because I've got to check a few things on my computer. Then we'll be back with hobby news, because uh, there's been a lot of news lately, so I've had to really condense it down to the best. Well, what I consider the best. And <laughs> then we have the usual whips and all of that. So we'll be back in a sec. This episode is brought to you by Autoloader Decals. Have you wandered around the shelves of your local hobby store and found that perfect model kit? Great tooling, fun to build and look, you remember seeing the subject. Perhaps it was a truck in the ubiquitous white UN paint scheme in the newspaper. Or maybe it was a Sherman tank from your local armor unit. Everything is lining up for a fantastic new project. One with a more interesting connection to yourself, instead of a project derived from a history book. Then you open the kit, and there are none of those specific markings to be found. Water slide decals really put the final touch on a model, and unfortunately for the model maker, most kit manufacturers won't put too much time into designing decals that produce a finished model in anything but its most stereotypical form. That's why Autoloader Decals exists. It is their sincere hope that you'll be able to find as much enjoyment using these special water slides as they have. Autoloader decal products are primarily focused on Canadian subjects, but in general if you're looking for markings that represent vehicles from lesser known parts of modern history, chances are you might just be able to find something worth trying. The water slide decals are printed through an inkjet printer and sealed with a high quality varnish to ensure their strength on the model. Unlike most other water slides, these decals only need to be submerged for a few seconds and can be placed right onto the model. They are incredibly tough and won't yellow over time. For an added benefit, decals intended for 1 to 35 scale are treated with a special varnish that gives a subtle, painted on look that's both in scale and more realistic than other brands offerings. All the products currently in production are listed in the store page. If you have a custom design you would like to order, the best way of making this order is to send an email through the contact page. Generally, the cost of a custom order will be 40 to 50% higher than any products that are in stock to account for labour. Also, as a special deal, if you, have, if you are ordering a set of custom decals and you mention the Micro Machines podcast, you'll receive a free exclusive MMP Pinju decal with your order. So next time you're looking to build a specific or unique vehicle, look towards Autoloader decals. Just go to www.autoloadermodels.ca for all your water slide decal needs. And now, back to the show. We're going to start with the hobby news. Um, there's definitely some really, really cool stuff that's coming out. <laughs> so first up, we're going to start with Ravel. My computer is going a bit glitchy on my screen. So we've got four main releases from them. There's a few more that uh, I didn't want to cover because they're not my kind of thing. But first up, we have in 35th scale a GTK Boxer. Mm. Um this is a really cool vehicle in real life. I got to see one when I was in, in Tank Fest, and holy crap, these things are big. Mm -hmm. In 72nd, we have a Krupp, a Krupp Protez KFZ69 with a 3.7 centimeter pack. Uh, Can't pronounce it, but I want it. Yeah, I've been either. <laughs> uh, 72nd, looking at a build up of uh, 70, oh, not 72nd, my apologies, 76. So that's even. So. Well, why would they do that? I'm not it's sure. It's, it's the 32nd scale of the 70s. I know. It's 76 <laughs> is just weird. The FX did it as well. It's it's used to do, um, but it didn't fit with it. I think it's HO scale. Yeah. Yeah. So they're trying well, to fit it with trains. Point. Yeah. Unless you want to have that with your rural railway. I don't see the point. Yeah. Uh, also, I've seen it built up. It does, Like 76 is very cartoonish. I call it the cartoon <laughs> scale. It, everything's a bit oversized or just weird. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in seventy second scale. However, they are they are bringing out a C fifty four D as part of the Berlin Airlift uh, back in nineteen forty seven, forty six, forty eight. But it's seventy five years. Yeah, so that's yeah, not not going to lie. When I when, 
when I first saw that screenshot, I thought, oh god, they made a Kabul pull out fucking diorama. <laughs> Well, you've got you've got the um, the glue bottle in the corner that's yellow and blue. It's like oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so this so this uh, so this is the seventy fifth anniversary of the Berlin airlift. Uh, so mm. this is a kit that um, has paint included, has uh, the glue included, um, uh, wood cutouts. So it looks like a great kit. And the C the C fifty four D was also known as the candy bomber uh, by the kids yeah. in Berlin. And I've I've seen one of these in real life in Berlin, and they're a great aircraft. So that's definitely something I'm going to keep my eye out for. Uh, also, nice. in seventy second, they are bringing out an M1A1 uh, mm. and an M1A2 Abrams. Uh, however, if you're going to go with seventy second uh, for an Abrams, you're probably better off going with Vespid or one of those ones, not with Ravel. It's um again, it's yeah. got the same problem as the uh, the Krupp. It's the it's chunky and basic if you if you're going to go 70 second abrams i'd go with vespa yeah. they've they've used some really good stuff yeah oh yeah up next we got something from mini art something a bit different they're doing an aircraft in 48 scale we have the p47 d2 the d25 re thunderbolt so they're bringing out a jug this one they're releasing two kits they uh one is a basic kit and they're bringing out an advanced kit uh, the advanced kit seems to, the only difference is it seems to be a full um, engine interior. You've got the gun bays. You've got a whole lot more options. So the basic one is just basic as basic. However, this is in 48 scale, and this will be massive. I mean, the, P, the P-47 is a giant aircraft, so one of these in 48 scale is going to be great. Um, yeah. It's been a while since Mini Arts released an aircraft, so this will be yeah. interesting. They're not releasing a goddamn stug or panzer four panzer three or <laughs> fucking God finally damn, T- God damn. t34 or t55 or something like that they're actually doing something different for once thank they Christ. seem to have almost as many stugs as actually existed i mean oh, every week yeah you're July, telling me yeah. it's, it's august 43 is i i actually went in with their panzer fours to find out what the difference is between the last five they've done and like the very <laughs> the, the latest one they've released was literally this specific one came out. There was about a hundred of them that came out of this one factory, and the only difference is the plate across the uh, the front plate uh, in front of the driver and the uh, hull gunner is welded, is bolted on, as opposed to the, just the standard plate. It's just got a little bit of applique armor. That is it. Oh, that is the only hell. difference. And they've created yeah, a brand new kit for it. Um, that seems like more something you can make a conversion kit for. You know? Yeah. Or extra parts in the box. Yeah, about that? yeah. for real. <laughs> you don't, you don't need a brand want. new kit for it. <laughs> it's just, but I do like that Mini Art are doing it at two different levels because it, it's like um, with armor when they do an interior kit and a, and a regular kit that you've got a choice. If you want a super detail, you can go for the advanced one. Yeah, but if you want a basic Thunderbolt, there you go. Yeah, okay. um, hopefully with, there's a difference in price as well. Yeah. It was like Tacom on their Blitz kits. Yeah, yeah. So, Same deal. I think it's, I think that's a good move forward. Yeah, you you send it. Yeah, having two, having a basic and advanced instead of like instead of trying to modify a basic into an advanced kit by buying aftermarket and then you have to cut out stuff and all of that. I think I think this is much better of having a baseline and an advanced separate. That's yeah. good move by Mini Art. Good move. Yeah. Mm. Up next by my. Beloved Tacom doing the great stuff yes. as usual. They are bringing out the P the PZJ PZJ G13. This is pretty much what is officially known as the Hetzer. The Hetzer in World War Two was made by the Germans was never called the Hetzer. It was only after the war. And this yeah. the G13 is mainly what was called the Hetzer. So this was a Swiss made um, oh. Hetzer. <clears throat> they replaced the gun in it. They've added on their own extras, and is that? I think it's timed well because Tacom have just released their latest line of uh, yeah, garrison. Three yeah, their three hitses. Yeah, early, mid, and late. Yeah, so I think this was just like, well, we can make it into this because it's the only real difference is uh, stuff added on on the top. The machine gun on the top. Mm-hmm. They're using the Swiss made one. They're using a Swiss gun in it that's got the muzzle brake, uh, whereas the standard German headset did, did not have a muzzle brake. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think it's great. This is this is 
this is great. It's the the, the Swiss Swiss Hetzers aren't well known about. If you do, however, yeah. if you do see a real life Hetzer in real life, it is not there. There's a fighting chance it is not a genuine. Most right. working Hetzers Please. you see nowadays are G13 converted back because huh. the Swiss didn't have them destroyed. <laughs> yeah. I it's, do wonder, though, what, what kind of market there is for a Swiss post-war tank. Well, they've got one right sitting in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> I mean that's sort of like your Cold War sort of people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, it'd be something different making a Swiss uh, countryside or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, if you can call the Swiss Cold War, they never fight anybody, do they? <laughs> Well, yeah, I know the, the ultimate neutrality. Nine hundred years of peace. Nine hundred years of peace, and they've come up with chocolate and the cuckoo clock. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, this this looks great. So this is something I'm excited for. I'll probably never see it in New Zealand, but I know it's out there. <laughs> no, you'll, you'll probably see it in about twenty years. If, if What's I'm, it like for you getting kits in New Zealand? Um. New releases, difficult. Uh, there is, I've been searching around every week. The Tamiya M18 Hellcat is not yeah. in this country at all for sale. No, you oh cannot God. find it. And I've searched every single website, um, auction site, all of that. It is not in this country at all. Do you, do you use BNA in Australia? Um, starting to, but shipping really brought me. So that's like, uh, yeah, specialized stuff. So I've been looking into them, but yeah, trying to get stuff in New Zealand is difficult. I use our local, the most of the most of the kits I buy is from our local eBay called Trade Me, and where I can find people right. putting on model kits that have been sitting around for forty years for a dollar or something like that. <laughs> Hence, why I make a whole lot of vintage kits that no one else will touch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I always think every kit should be deserves to be made, no matter who made it, when, and how long ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Up next from Amusing uh, Hobby, uh, uh, they're bringing it. out a T eighty U. So they're so they're uh, more of their Cold War Soviet Russian type armor. Although I think the t is the T eighty U. That's the U is not a Russian modification, is it? I can't remember. Yes, I I think it is. I think it is. Okay. Uh, well, that's that's. I mean, the T eighty isn't something I know a lot of. Um, I only knew it existed when only a few years ago, so it's not it's not a tank I know a lot about. But uh, yeah, they're bringing it out in thirty fifth full interior kit. Looks pretty good. Yeah, I do like with modern tanks. I like modern tanks with lots of stuff on them. Yeah, yeah. The ERA box and extra bits and pieces. You know. And I, I hate to say it, but the Abrams leaves me cold <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> the standard ones before they get the uh, before they got their Tusk uh, modifications, the SEP SEP three and stuff like that. You know, before they got the cool yeah. stuff on it. But whereas yeah. the Russian the stuff is just part. modified to hell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Russian stuff just looks good. Like it just does. Doesn't necessarily work well, but it looks good. I was going to say, but it doesn't. <laughs> hey, 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 half the battle is looking good. Okay, <laughs> so that's about as far as Russia gets. Uh, I just looked up the TATU, and the U stands for improvement. Oh it right, is... great. <laughs> <laughs> but it has different engine decking, additional protection with uh, explosive reactive armor, mm. new fire control system. Rubber side skirts. Oh, uh, turret roof has been and commanders and gunners' hat is provided with additional protection against attack from above. Yeah, oh, right. blocks on the top. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. All right. So this is one that I added on just before we started. So I don't know too much about it, but I'm still going to announce Ooh. it and pretend I know something. So this is by Magic Factory, where there's a dual combo in 35th scale. An MRZ uh, D4 All Terrain Vehicle Ultralight Tactical. Nice. So these are like militarized buggies, really. Yes. Yeah. But we've got two they of go them. Fast as fuck. Yep. One of them's got a trailer on it. Another one's got 
I don't know what the hell it's sit, sitting on the roof of it. <laughs> it. Looks like something from like the future, some sort of radar or something like that. Don't know what, yeah. but it looks cool. It looks like some kind of jammer signal core or something. Yeah. Yeah. Either that or he's got the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has got the laptop out, so he's probably trying to get a connection somewhere. Yeah. He's watching porn. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know hey, too much about Why isn't my hub showing up? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know too much about these vehicles apart from they do look pretty cool and the diorama um, sort of aspect of these would be pretty neat of course it's, it's a shame because I just built one of did. those you did my um, my future future diorama thing <laughs> um, and I had to get a resin kit because nobody made that vehicle surprise <laughs> yeah well that goes <laughs> At least I didn't scratch build it. <laughs> right. I'd be really pissed. So, but yeah, if you're into your modern sort of uh, ultralight stuff, this is for you. That's cool. And they're cool vehicles as long as no one shoots back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Up next from Ustar, uh, they are bringing something in 48 scale, which uh, hasn't been, um, there's, there's not been a lot in 48 scale released lately. And they are bringing out two King Tigers, one with the Henschel turret and one with a Porsche turret. These are full interior kits, got photo etch and all that. So, of course, U-Star is, they're, like, supported by Tacom. They're, they're like, they're like iHeart I kit for Dragon or something like that, aren't they? They're just, like, a sort of subsidiary type thing. A 148 scale full interior. How much would you hate yourself? I know. Mm. Especially because it's all going to be closed up and hidden anyway. Why... Yes, <laughs> that's one. That's my one thing with interior, full interiors. It's like yes, but it's a tank. Yeah. There are no yeah. ways to look into it because that's what they're supposed to be designed for. Yeah, totally. I I love seeing really nicely built interior kits, but showing them, uh, displaying them is an ass. It's yeah. either you have the exploded view and you have them on, you know, see through towers, or you just have them sitting there in bits. It's it's really hard to do. The only way I'm going to do one is if it's knocked out and blown open. Yeah. Mm, and that's yeah. the way I can get away with it, I think. Or you you get something like Tacom did with the uh, their hitzes and put a you have a like an engine deck that is clear or something like that, so you can see into it. Yeah. That's like a sort of display versus diorama thing. So there's um there's a tiger. I can't remember what scale it is now. That's just coming out now. And there is a cutaway option. So there are parts already cut away to show the interior, even down to road wheels, you know, mm. a quarter of them cut out. Yeah. It's yeah. like you, you'd see in a movie. That's tempting. Yeah. Those that are, is. I might do that. They look cool. But we have, yeah. uh, so if you're looking for a uh, King Tiger in 48th, you do have, I do like you have, they've brought out two a Porsche turret and a Henschel turret. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Up next, this is from uh, Special Hobby. We have five new releases. I'm going to go through them real quick. Up first, we have a Kitty Hawk Mark IV uh, that you can be that can be done in over the Mediterranean. Uh, that is with the U.S. Air Force, and over the Pacific in the Royal Australian Air Force. Uh, so that's in the top left. Bottom left, we have a Maryland Mark One or Mark Two. That is something I need. Absolutely, uh, the minute I saw it, I need I need that kit. I need that. <laughs> it's a cool looking. It. it is. It is cool. That that's right up my alley. Now, if only Dennis was here, he'd be um, very excited because they're bringing out a Japanese plane. Anything Japanese will get him going. A special <laughs> area would get happy. Yeah. So this is the this is the Ki fifty four High or Hickory, and, uh, and it is Japan's very. It was Japan's very first self-built transport plane before they built no. this they actually used license built c-47s from before the war <laughs> of course they didn't yeah. use them so they gave them uh so, but they had they built them as their own aircraft and they had a few modifications looks a bit like a diner a little bit yeah it's got that sort of sleekness to it so yeah yeah it's nice nice in the top right, we have a Supermarine Seafire Mark 15, and you have an FAA or an RCN marking. So, of course, that would also get Dennis and Don going because uh, Royal <laughs> Canadian Navy, of course. 
got to have the maple leaves on there. And yeah. at the bottom right, we have the Super Mystery B2 Early. It is basically the French uh, French um, F86 Sabre. Like, yeah. Concept Mirror. like it. It looks similar and all that. It's not. It's totally different aircraft, but it's their version. It was built around the same time and their sort of style. That sort of uh, swept back wing early jet, early nineteen fifties jets. Uh, very I mean, cool. Back in the day, mm-hmm. there's um something that you guys definitely won't won't know, and I can't even remember the name of it. But when I was probably twelve or so, there was a French TV series that was set. Um, about two guys in the French Air Force. And it was, I think it came from like the equivalent of a Tintin book, like a graphic novel, but it was them in the Air Force and they flew Super Mysteres and early Mirages and it was a really cool show. Ooh. And the only time they'd get into combat was with like pirates or mm. stuff like that. But you could see it was done with the um, collaboration of the French Air Force. So it had all the French Air Force aircraft at the time, the Vautour, the... The uh, Magister, Fuga Magister, all those. It was really cool. I need to find that. I need to look that up. Yeah, that sounds like something cool. So the, so that's uh, from Special Hobby. Special Hobby come up with some really cool stuff, I will say. So Yeah. And then, of course, we have from Trumpeter in 72nd scale. They're bringing out two kits. We have a German Leopard 2A6 MBT and an M113, M1135 Striker MBC RV. What is the bet that these will have possibly have Ukrainian market decals with them, considering <laughs> that both of these vehicles have been spotted being used in Ukraine right now? Yeah. So, but these are in seventy second scale. Not sure how good they would be. But yeah, if if you are uh, seventy second scale nutters, um, those who make <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, where <laughs> uh, yacht was and all of that. So, hmm. And then this one would have been nice. for Dennis if he was uh, here. This would have made, got him going. It's a stealth jet fighter. We have from Ming, the Chinese J-20 stealth fighter. And i got to say, that is the best box art I've seen in a while. That is, that is wicked. <laughs> yeah. Now, if that looks sci-fi, I mean... Yeah, yeah. It was like that sort of classic movie as well of, you know, the bay opens, the missile drops, and then fires off on its own. That's... Ugh. It's such a good, I, yeah. yeah. I I see that, and I I immediately hear "Highway to yeah. the Danger Zone." <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, and it's, it's interesting. Ming has switched from doing armor to uh, aircraft and stuff like that. I'm, it's curious to be curious to see as to why they've decided to do that. But, mm. but well, I still think that it looks like more people build aircraft than armor. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you go to the, like at nationals there's still quite a bit more aircraft than armor yeah yeah i think well it's sort of the og um sort of modeling isn't it so yeah so this this kit here you can uh, of course model it with uh, the bays open or closed including the side um including the side bays so you see it just a uh, just on the side hill you got this hatch looking thing so yeah. that, is, that is an additional weapons bay hatch. So that opens up and you no have an, a missile coming out of that. So you can have that model at the same time. Uh, all the uh, surfaces, are, you can be uh, posable. So, yeah, great looking kit. That's a, that's a cool box art. Yeah, but yeah, just the box art alone would be worth it. You know, you'd keep that one. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all we have for the hobby news today. Of course, there was a lot coming out and mainly because we haven't been recording for about a month so that's the reason why you can never say that this hobby is dying out when the fact that i had to condense a month's worth of hobby news down to about nine from a possible 40 so yeah <laughs> yeah so up first for whips muttons this is your this is the mccurva you've been uh, talking about yeah so i um having recently built that bandai tank um i really enjoyed it and i when i was doing kind of some kind of reference search and stuff, I did notice how much it looked like the Macava. And and clearly the whoever designed that Bandai tank had taken clues from it by having like a forward engine, um, a compartment at the back that crew can go into. So they totally copied it. Um, and then I saw one, a friend had built one at Nationals. He actually placed with it. 
and it looked so cool seeing one built up. Um, and then I, a tank that I was after at Nationals wasn't there, and I'd saved the money for it and um, walked around the corner, and there was one of these. It was like, oh, well, I guess I'm getting this then. <laughs> so, um, like I said, I don't build much modern stuff, but um, I just love the look of this tank because it looks so unlike all those other cookie cutter big square modern tanks that to me all, all have i mean it's i understand why they all look alike is because it's practical you know if it works that's how you build it but this just looks weird just looks odd the turret further back the shape of the turret the big flat front and it's just a cool looking tank so um while i've been off with this covid cough and stuff um I got it out and started putting it together and it went together slowly. And for someone who prefers painting to construction, it was a bit of a pain in the ass for that. <laughs> but, uh, but I finally got to a point uh, yesterday, I think, where I could put paint on it. And then, um, like I said, today it reached a point where I got matte varnish on it and now it looks like I imagined it. So um, I just got to build a little square scene i'm going to be good i'm not going to do a diorama or a vignette it's, <laughs> it's gonna but i still will stick a couple of crew in it <laughs> but um yeah it's just on a little plinth and will be that'll be it done just a good exercise just fun to do yeah just learn more skills um one thing that i did on it was um you can see from the photos you can see it has this anti-skid stuff on it the um, the truth of the matter is it's not actually anti-skid. What they did was they put this really rough surface on it um, to cut down glare and reflection off the tank out in the sun huh. to make it less visible. And that's the reason. So light hits it and doesn't reflect off. You don't get shiny bits that you can see in the distance. It just absorbs the light. Um, now, various companies do do um, anti-slip material that you can buy. And I was looking it up and it was $15 or so. And then someone on my page wrote and said, um, you might want to try this. And it's stuff from, um, just from a craft store. Um, one of those cheap companies like, um, Apple barrel or one of those, I can't remember it's upstairs now, but they actually do a medium that has grit in it. So you just uh -oh. squirt it into a little tub or something and then get your brush, dilute it a little bit, and you just paste it on. Um, so I thought, well, nothing to lose. It's not for anything particular. Let me just give it a try. And I taped off areas of the tank um, that you see in the reference photos and then just plastered it with this stuff. And once it had dried, I wasn't sure how it was going to look till it was painted. <laughs> and looking at the reference pictures, this is – as rough this is how rough it is in real life it's really that rough so um i was pleased with how it came out Damn, it worked that's that's looking really it good like three dollars <laughs> <laughs> it it looks damn accurate i'll give you that yeah as yeah. especially having the textures like it breaks up the tank and makes it look interesting you know yeah yeah, yeah. so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna so go through Sorry, you went a bit garbled there. Yeah, so that's my current work in progress. Um, the um, the big future diorama is still ongoing. I've got to do the finish off the base, and then that will be done. And then I will check my list and see what's next. Check it twice. <laughs> so for my whips this week, I got a little bit that I got done before I went overseas, but then I've done a little bit, as you'll see. So... First off, I wanted to uh, talk about my Musaru Cup entry. So I bought a 3D printer because I've always wanted one and something I desperately need, especially in New Zealand. Like trying to get aftermarket parts or, you know, just like small stuff you want to add to your model. Impossible over here. Well, next to impossible. You have to order stuff from overseas for it. And um, yeah, a 3D printer makes life a lot, lot easier. And this one is actually brand new like technically second hand i bought it on trade me but i got it for about 200 bucks new zealand and it's 
the guy said he never used it before. Like it's all, it's still in its original packaging. He wow. owned it for a year. Wow. Bought it for four hundred dollars. <laughs> sold it for two hundred dollars. Never yes. used. Yeah. Is that cubic is that what it is? Uh, no, this is a uh, Creality. Uh, it's a Creality. Well, I've forgotten the rest of the details. I was trying to make it sound like I knew what I was talking about, but I don't. <laughs> nah, just... <laughs> you, you and me both, buddy. You and me both. <laughs> We're all in the same boat on this one, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. It's a Creality LD uh, 002R resin printer. So uh, I've had a I've had a chat with uh, Floki and Dennis, and they said that yeah, it's a bit it's a bit older, but for being brand new and for the type of things I want to print off, perfectly fine. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons I wanted it is, of course, for the Musaru Cup. It's all been announced. Uh, I did my video for it, and if people know about the Musaru, we know what we're building. It is the ICM Ural four three two zero military truck. So, of course, the uh, one of the main things is you can do whatever you want to the truck as long as it's recognizable as the Ural. So the only main modification I'm going to be doing is I've spent a little bit of time on Tinkercad and I've designed something completely impractical and stupid, but that's because this is going to be a Horizon Island Defense Force build. <laughs> we made the executive decision that, yeah, with the MMP, we do stuff nuts. We go, we, we've got We've got Pinju, we've got the Horizon Island, we've got just our own way of doing stuff. So, of course, we're going to do a competition our own way, aren't we? Yeah. Yep. So, I've designed this multiple rocket launcher uh, based off the M-2-4 rocket trucks that the Marines used in Okinawa and Iwo Jima. Ebra. So, and they're really effective, actually. So, these are so this rail system is I designed it all by myself during lunchtime at work and during times that I shouldn't have been working on it at work, but <laughs> redacted <laughs> slow, slow days. Um, so this is going to be on the back of the Ural. It's going to be on a, a Pacific Island beach scene, going to have a bit of water, some palm trees, and I'm going to see if I can model this because these are all going to be separate parts that I need to put together myself. Um, I'm just showing it as finished product now. So I'm going to try and model it. So at least one or two of the rockets are mid launch. Right. Just to make it a bit more exciting. Yes. Um, so color scheme we're going to go for is going to be based on the red panda. So red panda colors and somewhat scheme. It's going to be tiger striped. Yeah, I'm going to go nuts with it because it's our first. It's our first entry into the uh, Moose yeah. Cup. Make Why not? Match. Absolutely. Yeah. Probably won't win, but hey, we're putting our mark on it. Absolutely. So 3D printing, all of this stuff is going to be really, really interesting and really cool. And yeah, you have no idea how excited I was when I got when I got the 3D printer yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like that, like it was in the box, and yeah, I, like I made sure that it could not move in the truck at all. Like I had the seat belt over it and all this <laughs> stuff. So this, this is yeah, this is making it home. It was an hour and a half drive of like terror. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but so that's what I'm going to be doing. So before I went off, uh, as I mentioned, I'm part of like five group builds that I don't think I'll finish any of them. <laughs> uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, the, the the French one for the Discord, I probably will eventually finish in time because there is no time limit for that one. But to say that one, there's no time limit. Yeah, but for the rest of it, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm never going to get it done. Oh well. <laughs> Although for the, so the top one is my BF one hundred nine Z or Zwilling, which is the uh, Germans' um, attempt at making something similar to the uh, twin Mustang. Yeah, you know, putting two one hundred nines together. There was only one prototype that never took off, mainly because of the airfield was at was bombed by the Americans, and planes don't survive a five hundred gr- kilogram blast from a high explosive. Well, Hell well. the fuck no, they don't. No, so it never flew. So purely as a what if. So this is a, uh, it's a, a model is the company that did this one and yeah. I could kill them. Um, <laughs> the turns out trying to put the fuselage together, uh, either the wall thickness inside is too thick or the cockpit itself is out of scale. Don't know what, but I had to remove about three millimeters of material from the edges of the, uh, 
the seat and stuff to get it to fit. Holy fuck. When when shit like that happens, you're like, did anyone actually try and build this after you guys finished making the kit? Yeah. Like, yeah the answer one. is no. <laughs> I will I will admit <laughs> I will admit I do know how sturdy I can build I can build stuff now because that fuselage when I was trying to put it together did launch its end up being launched <laughs> into the breeze block wall in front of me. So it did actually it survived. <laughs> this is this is yeah, it did actually fly for a brief second, and <laughs> the cockpit was still in one piece. That little the bathtub style, not a single piece came off it. So, so I glue things down well. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, so the so that's so those fuselage halves are finally put together with a stupid amount of super glue. I'd like to think thank Icky Sticky uh, for their. CA glues, they are wonderful things. They'll keep anything together, um, apart from my sanity. So that's <laughs> that's currently in a box off to the side. I don't have, and I'm just leaving it for now. I'm just I got to let it sit over there, think about what it's done. Um, <laughs> I've got to get some paint for it, so I don't have the right colors for it. So I'm just going to leave it alone for now. Um, Callum, I think uh, I think Messerschmitt is calling. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on the bottom, of course, I've got a green base for uh, my shop with Camel, the thirty-second scale Academy kit. A lot of people say that's a rubbish kit. It's actually a really good kit to put together as long as you put the machine guns up the right way. But it means you have to modify them as well. Huh. So the machine guns are actually molded upside down. <laughs> Uh, fucking hell! Yeah. So you, yeah. How did you do the rigging? What did you use? It comes with it. So the rigging comes with the kit. It's, what? Um, yeah, I know, right? The the decals on it are amazing. They're super thin. They fit to every recess and groove. And I got to say, like, it's a damn good kit. And it, it they only sell they sell for like thirty five bucks, wow. as opposed to say a wing nut uh, camel, yeah, which, is, which is which like, is another uh, again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, but I've always wanted a base for it because it's a large aircraft and needs to be sitting on something. Mm. And I just, I just wanted a green field. That's all I wanted to go underneath it because that's how, you, that's how they stood in World War One. But of course, the corner is a little bit bare, so I need a figure for it. Yeah, as Martin suggested before, I have a three D printer because <laughs> trying to find a one to thirty two scale British <laughs> pilot is impossible. However, I got a 3D printer now, so I can find someone to do it for me. And I, I think the same thing with bases, with a base for a tank or a base for an aircraft. To me, they just look so much better on a base. It's, it's their natural yeah. environment. And mm. it's, I almost feel like if I build something and don't do a base, it's like I'm disrespecting it. It's, it deserves a base. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that looks really good on, on a grassy field. Hmm. So this base is actually, I've got a whole bunch of picture frames just stashed around that I got given that yeah. no one has any use for. So I just uh, yep. pop the glass out yeah. um, and then just put a bit of um, styrofoam. I don't get that fancy XPF stuff you guys have. Um, <laughs> can't find that in New Zealand at all. So I'm just stuck with styrofoam. Um, but yeah, I literally cut it, pushed it down and then, uh, yeah, whacked a bit of grass on, a bit of airbrushing to make it a bit darker. Um, yeah literally took me an hour to build it so picture frames are a good way to get into diorama bases yeah yes well because trying to trying to make a frame for a diorama like trying to use balsa wood or just yeah fuck that balsa wood is a bit of a ball ache uh but i hate it i hate it um fucking warps but then sometimes just painting it black and depends on the material the base that it's been used so yeah yeah so this this I can whack. I got it out in a, like an hour, and most of that time was waiting for the uh, glue to dry. <laughs> Although that's because I used uh, spray adhesive as well. So, mm-hmm. but I mean it works. So yeah. So now my main issue is trying to find space in the house for it. Yeah. There's a there's there is one more reason I don't do a lot of bases and dioramas. Space. Yeah. I, I've built a lot of. I have forty five built models. Uh, in my house right now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of space <laughs> that needs to be taken. I've got a 116th Stug, 
that I got oh, when they were on, um, pre-order for ninety-nine dollars. I haven't got room for it. I'm selling it. Mm. Just no space. As yeah, that's, half- <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's half the problem, you know. It's like, where, where do you put it all afterwards? Because I want to, I want to keep them all, but yeah. so somewhere. My wife keeps asking. She's really super supportive, and. I, she's excited about ideas I have and I tell her and she's like, oh, well, how are you going to do this? What are you going to do this? And then always the last question she asks is, how big is it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> or where, it's like my daddy says, where are you going to put it? And it was just like, no, no, just, just, that's, that's a problem for future Callum. Yes. Present Callum <laughs> couldn't care. <laughs> I've got the idea. It's going to happen. Just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. it's like, I'll let him deal with it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then lastly talking about group builds so this is my um hella humbrol amx 1375 with the ss11 atgms um if you have a hella humbrol kit in your stash throw it away (laughs) jesus yeah they, they fucking suck oh this thing is um oh god it's nothing fits that well uh like you can you can see the the canvas cover for the oscillating turret it is it, no bueno it is not that good um half, most of the parts are being put together with ca glue and brute force um the the mesh for the uh the the basket that holds the uh missiles mm-hmm. doesn't come with the kit <laughs> And I can't couldn't find photo mesh in New Zealand for a uh, for a decent price, you know, not one that was like the cost of the kit. Mm. So instead, those are actually made out of band aids. Oh, um, really? Yeah, uh, they were the right shape, size, and everything just happened to fit. And I thought, well, wonder if that would. And of course, they're they're adhesive, so you just stuck it on, add a bit of extra thin super glue around it to make sure it doesn't go. But I mean, up close doesn't look too good, but from a meter away, which is the closest I allow people to get close to them, it looks all right <laughs> enough. There's so many out there, good news. <laughs> but yeah, so this is as far as I've got up to. I'm a bit stuck on weathering it at the moment just because I'm. Again, I've lost my mojo on this one, uh, so it's going to be sitting there for a while. Also, I cannot find any reference photos for uh, what the... This is going to be a Swiss uh, decal tank, because you get... Uh, in this one, in this kit, you get Swiss or Israeli decals, and I don't build Israeli, so... I was going... So I'm going with Swiss decals. But I cannot find any references for the color of the missiles at all. If any listeners out there know what it is... All I can find is like blue ones or half blue, half green. So I can't confirm which one's which because I'm pretty sure any project, any ordinance that is painted blue in real life means it's a training round. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, and I don't want it to be a training round. So uh, this one as well is going to have one of the rockets firing out. I've got a reference photo, a really good reference photo showing what it looks like. And I, I can recreate that using cotton wool and all that. And luckily, this kit was just sitting in someone's garage for years and years and years, rightfully so. Um, <laughs> they find that why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's a. Uh, it seemed like a bit of wire dropped into the box because it definitely it, it's not part of the kit. But it's a wire that's ultra thin, but strong enough to actually hold hold up one of the missiles in midair. But it's thin enough that it will be able to be covered with cotton wool and. Um, yes hidden so that's what i've done i've got a uh, so i've got one of the missiles drilled a hole in its backside shoved a wire up there with a bit of glue um <laughs> did yeah. it like it <laughs> 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 well i mean there was a sort of um curved smile on the front of it that i didn't put on it so i don't know maybe <laughs> um just, said, seemed, hey 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 that, that that seam line seemed a bit happy but yeah but apart from that um <laughs> <laughs> so but this, this one is um kind of stuck right now so i'm just again i i've got i've hit the problem of i've started started too many things at the same time and now it's like forest for trees yeah. so yeah <clears throat> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i hate having shelf queens as well i do i did not have any shelf queens on 
like I try and clear them as quickly as possible, but they're yeah, um, stuck. So hence why I made the base. <laughs> Understandable. So that's that's all I've been working on. Garrison, this is your Operation Cobra. Uh, yes. So I've got I've got two slides tonight. First one's kind of clustered fucked. Second one is pretty barren. But actually, this diorama's got a very, very, very funny story for everyone else. Why is that? Eight-legged creepy thing. Oh God, fuck you! God damn it! <laughs> you know what? Hang on a second. I'm gonna add those pictures in real quick, real quick. Oh, I'll, I'll reload it. <laughs> yeah, because that shit. Oh my, Martin, did oh. you hear about the spider that came onto my fucking diorama? No, I heard about the cats. <laughs> the spider. Yeah, it was a brown recluse, and I oh, damn no. near shit myself. <laughs> I, so. Oh. While I find these pictures to throw in here, uh, just so everyone knows, I have a very real fear of spiders. I was like seven or eight. We had a wolf and spider infestation in our house in Texas, and uh, I woke up with like six or seven of them on my face, neck, and chest <laughs> one day. <laughs> and ever since then, I just I I will puke. I'm not I will puke if uh, I feel one on me, or if I look at it. And this little fucker is, uh, and I've got proof in the picture, it was two inches big, which I know for a lot of females, that's not a lot, but by God, this little fucker was huge. <laughs> and, uh, man, he came running out, so I had finally gotten the mojo back to model, just a little bit. So I went downstairs, uh, hadn't been down there for a few weeks, you know, whatever, I cleaned up the, literally that same morning, I cleaned up the entire basement, I moved everything off my table. I wiped everything around underneath all the, the whole nine yards. Um, and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm ready to go. Go down there. I'm doing my thing. You know, putting, putting, I'm, I'm gluing trees back together that my fucking cats tore apart. And then I see something moving. <laughs> and I look up. And here comes this little eight legged asshole running <laughs> straight for me from underneath my paint bottle holder. And I'm like, oh God. So I, I shoot back. And as I shoot back, this little fucker climbs onto the di. Okay, go ahead and reload the slides, Callum. Okay. Uh, but this little fucker climbs over on the center of my diorama, climbs into the mortar pit, over the hedge on the right, runs off the diorama, and he's coming towards me, okay? So I'm walking towards the middle of my basement, like, God damn, I gotta find something to kill this bitch. And then I hear, and I've got bad hearing, okay? I swear to God, I heard this little guy hit the ground. <laughs> I turn, I turn, and he's upside down, flipping himself back over. And I'm thinking, I, I fucking heard that. I heard that. So I grab a wooden shelf. It's, it's a random wooden shelf that's sitting over in the corner right now. And I whack the bitch nine times with it <laughs> and finally killed it. And then I didn't go in my basement until we got it sprayed. Uh, for spiders and shit. Got the whole house outside and inside sprayed. And then I didn't go down here 10 days until 10 days after that. Uh, and then my wife, bless her heart, she came down here and cleaned up for me real quick to make sure there was nothing hiding. And uh, well, yeah, now I'm back down here. I swear to God, if I see another one, I'm done. I will <laughs> fucking... If, if you hear me scream, that's why. <laughs> so you, you, I reckon you should have tried to like kill it with fly spray and then you could have mounted it in the diorama. That would no, cool. no, I would no. I literally, dude. I, I, I swear, man. When I saw that little guy running towards me, I got chills up my back. I, I was more. I'm more scared of spiders than I was when I got shot at. Okay, that I hate spiders. They make me want to puke. Uh, just ugh, fucking. Just staring at it right now on the computer just makes me want to punch the computer and run <laughs> you might have an issue if you ever come to new zealand then we have i will never come to new zealand i will never i was so glad when i found out we weren't going to australia for deployment now i will say <laughs> the jungles of okinawa i have some pretty big fucking spiders and i hated it but yeah like we have the Avondale spider and they get so big that like they get to about the size of your hand and like the really like mutant ones occasionally you get the big ones there was one that dropped onto concrete and i heard it scared uh, i heard, I heard yeah. it drop, and then i heard the, i heard the footfalls on concrete uh, <laughs> even me and my uh, dad was like oh shit <laughs> uh, 
Ah, fuck you. God. Oh, oh God. Oh. Some, I mean, I've got some great photos I can send you of ones I've found. No, fuck right you. No, no. Oh, God. <laughs> Hell no. Oh. Oh, I hate spiders. I fucking hate spiders. Uh, fuck the spider. Moving on to my puma. Something more happy. Happy thoughts. Um, where's Bob Ross when you need him? Fuck. Um, ugh. Okay. Whew. So, top left photo is three pictures in one. Uh, got my puma. Painted that up today. Uh, to the right of that, we've got American infantry moving down a road. To the right of that, you got the front view, the overview of the diorama. It's uh, supposed to be Operation Cobra, uh, Americans, American Recon Patrol, flanking around a hedgerow field to get a, or the Puma. It'll have two crew members on the outside looking at a map, kind of arguing where to go. Uh, the bottom left and center, you've got the crew before I repainted their undershirts to be green. Um, and I did some more painting on it tonight. I've got a box or a tub of leftover tree limbs that my cats chewed up. Fuck you, cats. That I'm going to put on the puma. And then on the right-hand side, just kind of got the mortar pit. Uh, you know, I, I gave everything a wash, glued it all down a few weeks back, and just thought I might throw that in there. Nice. But, uh, yeah, that's, uh, as of right now, that's where Operation Cobra's at. Uh, since these pictures were taken, I've hand-painted rust on the slack, ad- or not slack adjusters, uh, the leaf springs. Uh, I've painted all the locks on the side, the back fuel exhaust tanks. Um, uh, excuse me. Uh, the one uh, jerry can I painted fueled gray. Um, yeah, so. I really but, like uh, the vegetation. Your vegetation always looks really good. Like thank you, thank you. They look believable. I, I really try. <laughs> I really want to make it look. Uh, I mean, fuck! It was so good. It was so good that a brown recluse said, "Fuck no, take the outside out of here." That's where I wanted it. Uh, yeah, fuck. Uh, he got confused and walking around going, "Hang on, these are smaller than normal." <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you know, it's, uh, dioramas, the little things. It's like the flowers, just the red. Yeah, flowers where they're walking through, and then the flowers by the mortar pit. It's it's little things like that make all the difference, I think. I I would agree, and you know I appreciate that, and you know trying to recreate like the blast craters with the uh, the carbon or the, yeah. the, the smoke on it, and you know all the fun stuff like that, man. It's just that's like you said, that's what makes dioramas, and it's what makes it fun building it, you know. Yeah. And and I always get to a point in my like big dioramas like this that drag on. I get to the point where I'm looking at it and I see every little thing wrong with it, and that's all I see. Yeah. But then I share it with people, and they're like, "Oh, this is great! That's awesome! How'd you do this?" And it's like, you know what? That is a pretty neat little project. I'm, yeah. I'm happy with it. Yeah. Um. So I appreciate that comment. Um. But my second slide is uh, I did this. It's a MiG-21 Horizon Island Defense Force, and my first jet and one seventy second scale it is from academy and it's the fish bed version of the mig 21 um but it's on a runway and i just kind of half-assed it i ain't even gonna lie i built this to try and get back into the hobby uh but it just it didn't work and you can see the product is not it's not my best it's not close to my best it's just kind of there uh, which is fine, you know. It's I, we all I have don't those builds. Think there's such a thing as wasted time modeling because what, however it turns out, you learn something from it. Every time. that is fair, that is fair. I, I I'll give you that because uh, the camo scheme, I I usually freehand mm-hmm. with my, all my camo schemes, but this one I used the uh, AK uh, putty or whatever the fuck it's oh, called. Yeah, yeah. And first time using it had a good time with that i will I'll, i will say that it was fun experimenting with that but uh the moment i finished leading up to the point where i painted the camo was boring and then right after i painted the camo i was boring and i didn't care for it i just forced mm-hmm. myself to do it mm-hmm. now i will say i like because i got to use the decals that dennis gave me for the hidf that was fun uh and my, my son, like, he co- he comes downstairs every night and he wants to look at the P40 I've done, the Corsair, the jet, the tanks and whatnot. And he loves it. He yeah. adores that thing. 
So that's 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 something that came out of yeah. it. But but uh, yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully before the end of the fucking group build, I'll have this Operation Cobra diorama done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got three days. Yeah, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> I mean, I've got for the Puma. I need to finish painting the shovel. The straps that hold down the jerry cans. Uh, I've got two shovels, straps, axe, uh, compression clippers. I've got to uh, put the wheels on, give it a gloss coat, decals, matte coat, weather, and then finish the figures, which won't take too long. And then that's really it. So. <laughs> I say that, that's going to turn into fucking three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I can do that in like three hours. Fucking nine fucking weeks later, I'm not done yet. Yeah, I'm not sitting here going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, plenty of time. <sighs> <laughs> right? Uh, well, I, I say that, and I've I've got all day tomorrow I can work on it. Then Monday and Tuesday I've got the evenings, and then that's it. So, yeah, easy. <laughs> yes, hundred. I got this. No, easy day, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, speaking of that little group build, so the Normandy campaign group build. So, if you want to join, a little bit late, unless you're really, really, <laughs> really, really fast. <laughs> Because <laughs> at the time of recording, you have three days. By the time I get this edited and out, yeah, no. Um, so, of course, <laughs> it f finishes on August 30th. Uh, then you, we'll just need everyone to submit in what they've got, and we'll judge it, and then yada, yada, yada. So that's almost finished. Uh, once this is finished, uh, Garrison, we've got the next group builds ready for announcement, do we? Or... Uh, no, we're going to wait until the HIDF one is finished, and then oh, yeah. we'll announce the next ones. Sweet. So, speaking of, so we have the, oh, God's sake. we have the Horizon Island Defense Force group build, so that finishes on October 6th, so you, you've still got a bit of time. Oh, yes. So, hopefully those are, we've already had some submissions in, uh, mainly from Don, with his, um, fire support M113, which that is thing, sexy as fuck. Oh, that thing looks so <laughs> cool, especially with the snakes and stuff on it. That oof. yes, he, he almost outdid his a uh, Cold War group, his a Cold War group build one, maybe. So yeah. I think he did. Honestly, it's fucking spectacular. Yeah. So there, there is some stiff competition in this one. So yep. You're, so yeah, you still got what about a month and a half. Oh God. Math, hang on a second. What is it? Fucking, it's basically August first. We'll we'll just say that. So, uh, yeah, about a month and a week. Yeah. So, still plenty of time to get those in, get them finished. Can't wait to see because, yeah, Martin, this is this is the group of where you, this is yeah. our world that you just go nuts. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, Ezra put a flak eighty eight on the back of a jeep or something like that and made it. <laughs> somewhat feasible i mean the engine would struggle but you know it makes he made it look like it's part of it i mean a good you, bit to actually fire it <laughs> oh yeah um i mean you've got i've got two horizon island builds at the moment one that's been going on for way too long but that's because of uh trying to find electrical parts for it so i've got my flame thro ugh, flame flamethrower conversion m113 with the uh scratch built turret and um trailer and all of that i've got a spare willy's jeep which is going to be turned into a mortar carrier because i've got i've had a i built a 35th scale mortar two years ago painted it all of that just been sitting around doing nothing didn't know what to do with it i just built it because i was bored one day so that's going to go on the back of the uh, jeep as a impromptu mortar carrier so i've got those two at the moment so i might actually get the jeep done by <coughs> october so we'll see cool. i've got that uh martin i sent you the post with that horizon yeah, yeah. defense force uh well that yeah the uh that big road uh fuck highway the highway defense so that yeah. that's going to be fun and then Great. of course we cannot end the 
episode without thanking our Patreon supporters. So we have Paul Gallagher uh, over in Singapore and Lord Floki, who everyone knows we've had them had him on the podcast before, and we will have him on again. Now, of course, uh, Paul Gallagher is an exceptional modeler. I uh, don't know if you've seen any of his stuff, uh, Garrison, but he's the same as me. He makes eclectic stuff. He's made some really cool stuff. I think we should probably try and get him onto the episode, onto an episode, just to talk about his kind of stuff. So, I would Paul, agree. if you're listening, you know, the invite is there. So if you want to join this Patreon, just go on to patreon.com or whatever it is, forward slash micromachines podcast. You'll find outtakes from episodes, you know, all the jokes Garrison makes that I'm not allowed to put on YouTube or Spotify. You're welcome. Um, You know, just all the stuff that we can't put on normal media. It's going to be all in there. There's a secret episode that we recorded and forgot to release. So that's in there. And we will be released. We will be looking into. We have a whole bunch of STL files that we've made for our stuff. We're going to flick them onto you guys. If, if you have a uh, 3D printer and all that, that's all going to be part of it. So, yeah, there's some cool stuff there. It's only, what, three bucks a month or something like that. So it's dirt cheap. Means that we can keep on, keep with hosting and stuff like that. So, yeah, if you want to join the Patreon, show some support. Yeah. Anything else anyone else would like to add? Martin, Garrison? No, don't think so. Uh, well, just want to say thank you guys for uh, sticking with us. Now we're gone for a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Callum, for enjoying your life. Um, yeah, no, it sucks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, three weeks, uh, paid, va- three weeks paid vacation in Europe. Oh, it's a hard life. <laughs> Shit. Well, f- for real, though, man, it's... Uh, and we, we appreciate everything Callum does for the podcast. Uh, sorry the other guys couldn't be here tonight, um, but we appreciate you guys listening, staying tuned, and uh, keeping up with us, whether it's on the Discord, over social medias, or uh, just here you know, via Spotify or YouTube. Uh, appreciate everything you guys do for us, even if it's just a view. We appreciate it. And also, a massive big thank you to Martin for joining us for this episode. It's been, uh, it's been a great episode. It's been amazing to have you on, and yeah, this has been a great conversation. Thank it you. has it's been, been a fun. pleasure. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> well, thank and, you for answering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we'll see if we see if you want to join in on another episode sometime. So, but yeah, yeah, invite is always open. We'll say that. Thank you. Thank you. So. Since Dennis is not here, gets us up to me to close this out. So, if you have been listening or watching this episode up to this point thank you so much for enjoying the micro machines podcast and we will see you next week with i don't know maybe a guest maybe a subject who knows you'll find out when we decide it until then (laughs) we'll catch you guys next time see you later see you bye everyone